you know, we think that eventually these interest rate hikes are going to have to bite more. I don't expect the Fed to cut rates until the second half of next year. Maybe the Fed is done. The notion of higher for longer, I think, is somewhat being lost on investors. The economy moved slowly and inflation has come down. Personally, the Fed had very little to do with it. There's also a chance that inflation, you know, doesn't fall back to one and a half, that it gets stuck at two and a half or three. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. I'm alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market positive again on the S&P up by 0.2%. This line from Julian Emanuel of Evercore, who absolutely nailed it on NVIDIA. TK, great, isn't always good enough. Yeah, great isn't good enough. And Citigroup came out with a very terse thing. They said, we maintain a buy, but it's a range-bound buy, which you rarely see. And what it is is... I guess enthusiasm over the plan forward, worries about China. We all know this after 4 p.m. yesterday. The world stopped at 420. You believe it? Yesterday is like worse than Apple. Just going out for the numbers. It's like NVIDIA. And this is like and, the darling of the stock market rally this the year. The darling so. is a perfect way to put it. But the answer is, is some of these people are saying it works, maintain buy, but how richer can rich get? That's Let's get to thing. some south side research yeah, from Abacor. Just another run of the mill blowout quarter <laughs> for NVIDIA. Bloomberg Intelligence. Lisa, I think this is just. Amazing to see. NVIDIA's third straight double-digit percentage beat of sales consensus this year. Bramo and a race. Okay, so this is exactly what I was looking at, the actual numbers, that revenue in the current period will be about $20 billion. The expectation ostensibly was $17.9 billion. Some people had expected as much as $21 billion. This was punished on Wall Street uh, in the immediate aftermath. But this came even with the declines they saw in China, which means that there is enough demand to suck up uh, what would have been purchased by China and raises these long-term questions uh, about just the ability to produce enough chips. So at a certain point, this is really bullish. But if we just priced it all in? At the very least, Tom, can we call this a validation of the rally so far year today? I like what Dan Ives said, and then he went to the derivatives. He said, okay, NVIDIA is the focal point, but there's the first derivative, the second derivative, the third derivative of this AI stuff, which frankly I don't understand. Mandeep starts talking and my eyes glaze over, my ears too. And the answer is, the answer is there's a fallout here that redounds on Microsoft a bit in the news, but 15 other, 20 other companies as well. Can tech journalists go to sleep now? I think they probably can. Yeah, I think the open you know, AI saga you know. coming to a close, and we're kind of back to where we started, Bramo, but with a different board. Sam Altman returning to open AI. Although with that much closer of a relationship with Microsoft, I think that's really the takeaway. Not only was Microsoft a 49% stakeholder in the company to begin with, but now they're the ones saying, okay, yeah, the joke's over. You can't do this again where you don't tell us and you just kick the CEO out and then there's no rationale. So yeah, <clears> this, things are gonna change. Things are going to change. We're going to punish you so much. Yeah. Larry Summers is coming on the board. Is it like Liz Truss? Is it like Liz Truss where Altman gets a Microsoft pension because he was there so long? I've got no idea, TK. Isn't this just kind of like an interim board, Lisa? Isn't this about a board putting together some kind of better governance structure and then we'll appoint new directors? Larry Summers already has seven other board chips, so I imagine that he has a lot on Be his nice. hands. But I'm looking right now at, you know, what we're looking at in terms of bringing adults into the room, trying to create the right structure. And maybe this is just a placeholder. I'm really not I, I an expert on exactly what they're doing because, honestly, I haven't really got any clarity Wall Street, on what transpired. Wall Street Week this Friday, Lawrence Summers and Sam Altman will be with David Weston. Uh, I'm making that up, folks. But the, but the answer is Larry Summers brings a lot of academic firepower with his presidency at Harvard. He's not just another economist putting out a shingle. The end of the soap opera, I think we all hope. Let's get to some real news. Yeah. This one right here. We talked about it yesterday. Hamas agreeing to free 50 <coughs> hostages from Gaza in return for a four-day ceasefire with Israel and Lisa, the release of 150 Palestinian prisoners. And it could be the first phase of maybe a few phases of seeing the same kind of thing. So now the question really goes to, A, does it happen, uh, which everyone is hoping that it does to try to prevent some of the carnage that we have seen and bring hostages home. And the second thing is, where does that leave the conflict, right? It's not over. So is this the beginning of some kind of resolution? I think it's interesting that markets have not responded either to this news or to the war as it's ground, uh, grounded on. And that to me is interesting because is this not any more a market moving event? To your point, the war continues. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been very clear about that. And the objective, the sole objective is still the same. 
to wipe out Hamas. So you've got a four-day ceasefire, but ultimately, Bramo, yeah. we're going back to the same issues. And, and, and here's, and this is from the Telegraph, John and Netanyahu, quote, we are at war and the war will continue until all our goals are achieved. That's from the Prime Minister of Israel. More on that story a little bit later. Let's turn to the price action. The scores look like this on the S&P 500 this morning. We're positive uh, by 0.1%. Yields aren't up. They're a little bit lower. We're down a basis point, Lisa. 4.37.89. It's a break of 4.40 in the last 24 hours. And things have been relatively stable. So, yes, we're grinding lower, but it's a grind. It's not a whipsaw, which maybe gives people a little bit more confidence. 8.30 a.m. to me is the big news of the day. U.S. initial jobless claims. We also get some durable uh, sales as well. We're just taking a look at the unemployment rate creeping higher. And it's been a steady creep higher throughout the year, increasing about a half a percentage point uh, over the past six to eight months. Do we end up seeing initial jobless claims confirm that type of trend? And then is the market reaction? significant. 10 a.m. we get the final read of the Michigan Sentiment Survey. Might be interesting to you since you care a lot about it. I'm particularly interested in the expectation for the I'll next five long to ten gone, years. <laughs> it's 10 a.m. How can long you can you possibly her after, be? Can you, you need to come on TV. 9.56.30. <laughs> then you're out the door by 9.57. I'll be picking up pies and I'll be long gone. You, Mitch, sent I walked by her desk today. She's it's got Martha final. Stewart up. The perfect oh, right. <laughs> and how do I destroy it? But honestly, I'm looking at just, you know, the five to ten inflation expectations that John will not be looking at and then also just following on the story about the potential <clears throat> for hostages to be released we are looking for that to happen starting as soon as early Thursday in the morning and I, I mean to me I just really want to see uh, how this happens and then what comes next as we were talking what about. comes next is continued war and it will be a ballet of hostages as they slowly come out I believe Aaron, da uh, Aaron David Miller scheduled to be with us today which is wonderful that'll He's be cool serious serious expertise. A little bit later, we need to talk about some of these market calls as well, Tom. Yes. 5,000 seems yes. to be the popular number right now. Yesterday, Bank of America, Savita Subramanian. I agree. RBC's Laurie Calvacina, 5,000 year end next year. I read every word of it, and it's really important here with Calvacina. She's saying, look, this is the post-COVID market, and it's just um, starting. I think that the SPX, we, we were sort of benumbed by it on radio right now, a great chart showing the divide, John, from 4,400 up to 5,000. Ed Calvacina there at 5,000. Throy Yardeni up on top, his own research shop, 5,400. To put this in scale, 5,400 is a Yardeni 41,700 on the Dow. John, I've never framed that, which means I've never framed SPX 5,400. We are thankful on this Thanksgiving <clears throat> that you framed it for us. That's good. Thank the pilgrims looked Thank at the you. Dow. Thank you. Damn it. It's going to be all show. Makes, <laughs> makes a difference. It's going to be all show. Oh, you should have seen. To us all. They didn't have a Bloomberg on the Mayflower. They did not have a Bloomberg on the Mayflower. They had a, I was in bed last night. They rainbow. started on speakerphone over the phone last night. We thank Give you. it up. Give it up. Yes. Jonathan yeah. Stubbs joins us now. We're thankful. The equity strategist at Barenberg. Jonathan, thank you for joining us, sir. Let's just start with this tech dominance. NVIDIA out with some stellar numbers. Not getting much love in the pre-market this morning, but getting a ton of love year to date. The winners of 2024. Do you expect they'll be the winners of 2023? Um, I, I think yeah, in, investors are in a bit of a bit of a sort of hard place here because you you follow momentum and you're still sort of running some and, and some's the key word some of these sort of uh, megas of tech winners clear some momentum winners in the market uh, right now and as you say they've they've, they've been incredible performers year to day but you go back to sort of signals from sort of valuation and uh, the the broader u.s tech sector is trading you know back to an 80 percent <coughs> pe premium against global global equities which is the tmt peak so you're getting valuation signals, uh, which some are going to be very happy to ignore, which are telling you to do one thing, momentum signals telling you to do the other thing. Uh, it, al it also uh, overshadows what's happened in broader tech this year. And one of the, one of the worst performing indices around the, around the world on, on a median basis has been the NASDAQ Composite Index. Uh, obviously, that's the, you know, the, the 4,000 stock index. And that's because half of the, the companies in there, 2,000 companies, ended this year as loss makers. And if you're losing money, uh, into into a sort of sharply higher interest rate environment is is a tough it's a tough gig. So, tech tech is being uh, you know, it's, it's very much a, a two speed right. street right now. Um, the, the very big ones have, have been stunning performers, and into next year, investors have got a big a big call to make. At the very least, they have to hedge exposure to sort of AI right. and tech into right. next year. Uh, Jonathan, there's a it's percolating right now. This idea of fundamentals, looking at CFA type, you know, ratios and accounting statements and technical analysis. I love the acuity of your note 
that the, you should put more weight on technical analysis. Discuss that. How do you actually affect putting more weight on technicals? Yeah, I mean, most, most of the market is you know, fundamentally driven increasingly over you know, 20, 30 years. Obviously, uh, investment horizons have got sort of shorter and shorter term. But, but also, over the last <laughs> of two or three years, one of the biggest bull markets has been in uncertainty. And you know, when I go around you know, all parts of the world right now, it's, almost, it's that lack of conviction into next year, which is the, the dominant focus for most investors. So a backdrop of uncertainty, which is political, geopolitical, policy, macro, et cetera, um, re really sort of, I think, shines a, a much uh, you know, brighter light on technicals because technicals are a very pure way of reflecting investor crowding in, in markets at key times. So, so we, we look at sort of a, a range of technical indicators, but the, the core ones like RSIs, like, like breadth, investor sentiment, they, these are consistently and have consistently given pretty good uh, signals for investors to sort of turn up or turn down exposure to equities over the last of two to three years. And, and we, we keep using them. And if you're using them today, obviously, we've gone from one end of the RSI range uh, over oversold to, to now we're very close to sort of overbought. So again, it's another signal where if we're being true to those signals, we're, we're probably not sort of chasing this incredible rally we've seen over the last three to four weeks. Do bonds matter for equity valuations from here? Yeah, I mean, huge, hugely. Um, I mean, clearly, you know, the, the, the rally we've seen in equities, you know, in the last three to four weeks, which, you know, in small mid-cap land has given all of the returns that small mid-caps will, will, will deliver this year. In, in, in global equities, the rally we've seen has given more than 50% of the year-to-date returns. So it's been a spectacular sort of very short rally. And it's happened, you know, as, you know, 10-year treasuries have backed off sort of five handle, backed off of four and a half as the market's... Uh, you know, gotten into a more comfortable place on inflation and rate degradation. So, so bond yields matter hugely, uh, and also the sort of duration impact is, is, is very important. And the, the higher for longer sort of narrative is still very much in play. We are in a sort of a more normal interest rate environment, uh, and that suggests hurdle rates are higher, its funding costs are higher, challenges different business models. So bond, bond yields matter hugely in this market. They're also a, a competitor for uh, you know, capital. So, you know, if, if I've got a dollar to put into the market today, I can get 6% on investment grade in the US. I can get some 9% on high yield. I, I can go to the two year and get 4 or 5%. That's a, that's a genuine competitor to equities as we go forward. So that, that also changes the, the capital allocation mix for, for investors. Jonathan, it's great to get your perspective. Thanks for the insight. Jonathan Stubbs there of Berenberg. I think we've got to frame this. How long does it take to write one of these outlooks, Tom? Starts about a month ago? Maybe a little bit longer. Let's spend yeah, a bit of time doing this stuff. But they're thinking about it from July 4th. Of course. You know. So let's frame that out. Let's say you get to November. <clears throat> you've really nailed down your thoughts, your feelings about 2024. And then all of a sudden, the single month, the S&P 500 is up another 8%. The Nasdaq is up another 10%. The TK, these are big moves already this month. And still from here, we're looking for a <clears throat> double-digit return in 2024. Can you imagine if this was published in early November? Well, y yes, it would have been very different than How now. controversial like 40, it would have been. Yes, 5,000 is the new 4,700. You have to remember that all of the strategists, the good people that we have on here, we mentioned Lori Calvacina earlier, they have to report to revenue producers. And the revenue producers have to go out and speak to the troops, institutional and retail. And in real time, this is, it's happening, and I can't emphasize this enough, it's happening, getting from Monday to Friday, right now is tough. And the most important question to ask is, how do you feel? At least that seems to be how what do we're you hearing. Feel? <laughs> I feel really good. I feel like I'm in the holiday spirit. It seems like everyone else is doing. Look, Lori Calvacino, the reason why I said that is because you mentioned Lori Calvacino. Sure. And she said, we've been telling investors <clears throat> that we believe the weekly AAII investor sentiment survey has been the best star in the sky to navigate the US equity market in 2023. Basically, what we just right. heard there from it Jonathan is Stubbs. How do you feel? Help, help me over good. here. Is, is Lisa doing stuffing in the 9 a.m. hour? <laughs> the perfect stuffing in the 9 a.m. hour. I'm okay. just saying that these would have been called for something like 20% upside at the end of October. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big turnaround in the last month it's or so. In, in December's happy month. You, you 2 p.m. I don't know. So from New York City this morning. Uh, window dressing. Good morning. <laughs>
That was Ian Bremmer, the president and founder of Eurasia Group, speaking on Balance of Power yesterday evening ahead of this morning's announcement that Israel and Hamas agreed to a temporary ceasefire and the release of some hostages. That's the latest out of the Middle East from New York City this morning, the latest in this market. Equity futures pulling back just a touch on the S&P 500, <coughs> now positive by 0.16%. In the equity market, we pulled back yesterday. NVIDIA a little bit lower. Bramo, even with some fantastic numbers, just kind of the story of the last year, I guess, validating massive returns, but not good enough. How high is the shadow bar, right? I mean, you wonder how much <coughs> the, the, uh, the gains of the year have gotten baked into similarly catastrophically amazing uh, types of returns going forward. Is it sustainable? And that's really the question that we have to ask well, for all the moonshots we've seen in big tech. We've seen some moonshots, but far more importantly are the non-moonshots, where they're lifting up and things that were modeled out to go up 8% are going up 12%. Things that were modeled to go out a lofty 15% are going up 21 To me, that's much more interesting than, you know, the given story stock. Moonshot, because, you know, John bought NVIDIA and I didn't. To be yeah. fair, though, this is more than just a story, right? These are real numbers. Oh, We're yeah. talking about oh, yeah. 3x revenue year over year. Yeah. It's, it's kind of and, phenomenal to see. And I looked at the breakdown, and this is not the gaming area. This is the AI, you know, the Sam Altman area. And somebody said yesterday, different nations are literally buying block, block purchases of NVIDIA products because there's nothing else up. That there. someone was Bramo. Hey. That was Lisa. I can't, I can't you know, I, I, that the, was the Lisa. brain fails. I mean, I'm looking at flight delays at LaGuardia. Leave me alone. You know. Flight delays at LaGuardia? Yeah, at Newark. It's, it's a 40% 40, 40 delay right now. It's already at already. Newark, Is that already. because it rained this morning? Yeah, it rained this morning. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That'll change things, Tom. Yeah, well, Middletown, the Gulf Stream is not delayed, but you get wet getting on the plane. You're getting on a plane today? Yeah, we're, you know, we're going. Where are you going? South, you know, the sun. In <laughs> Brooklyn. Oh. <laughs> South Brooklyn. <laughs> My father used to literally say, we're going south, Pittsburgh. <laughs> Lily would do that. You're tortured by that, Tom. Tortured. It was, okay. a, it was a deprived childhood. Joining us right now, and this is serious conversation with his expertise, his experience in service for the United States. He's a former senior U.S. intelligence official and, of course, at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Norman Roll has been very good to us in briefing on this terrible war in the eastern Mediterranean. Norman Rule, just simply, what is the level of intelligence that we have on Gaza? How blind are the Israelis as they work north to south in Gaza? Good morning. Um, Israel, although it was surprised by the uh, October 7th attack, has traditionally had exceptional intelligence on this area. And I think we need to keep in mind that it has captured hundreds of prisoners. It has used tactical SIGINT. It has used uh, drones to acquire a vast amount of intelligence. And this hostage exchange will provide about four days for them to ingest is what must be a massive amount of information from prisoner right. interrogations to laptops to shape a, a, a future uh, attacks in uh, four or five days. <laughs> Ian Bremmer told Bloomberg here in the last 12 hours that this war is not over. On a percentage basis, how much of this war is over? Well, that's difficult to say because the war itself being over would require the eradication of Hamas as a, as a threat to Israel, and that requires the eradication of Hamas's senior most leadership and the destruction of their weapons caches. Now, Israel has destroyed about 400 tunnels. It has is, is taken out several dozen Palestinian commanders from the Palestine Islamic Jihad and Hamas, but they have a ways to go. Uh, this operation right now uh, requires that they remove more civilians who are under significant threat. And then they've got to move south to Khan Yunus, which will uh, probably begin in about four or five days. So this war has, a, has weeks, if not months, to go forward. Is this war winnable, Norman? Are any of these goals achievable at a time where they're fighting uh, you know, a certain degree of hatred and ideology that has grown up out of uh, circumstances that hate is going to be continued? There is no question that Israel can eradicate most of Hamas's and Palestine Islamic Jihad's senior most leadership and their weapons capability and many of their tunnels. But as you correctly stated, that there is going to be a, a foundation of indoctrination and hate that really must be addressed. And that is going to be the job of the, the day after the two-state solution. It's going to be difficult. And the most challenging aspect of the day after is not going to be identifying the leaders on the diplomatic table, but who provides basic security and, and 
Palestinian society to prevent new militants from emerging with a Hamas 2.0 or an ISIS 2.0 in the ruins of Gaza. Arab nations have come out and said that they don't want to be the ones that are the peacekeepers. They don't want to send troops into Gaza. Israel has talked about it and then pulled back after people said, no, you are not occupying uh, Gaza once again. Who could possibly take on this role and who could possibly lead uh, a nation that has to or, or, or a territory or, that needs to really be rebuilt in a massive way? This is a hugely important and yet unaddressed questions. My contacts within the region and within Washington say that there really is not yet a plan. One could imagine a situation where a UN mandate, perhaps put forward by the Emiratis, who have the Arab seat on the UN Security Council, could create some sort of international force that would be augmented uh, or supported behind the scenes by Western actors. But we're a long way from, from getting there. And until we're <laughs> able to do the nuts and bolts of putting putting Gaza's basic security right. infrastructure together, we're not going to be able to achieve the peace that everybody wants. Norman, our framework of your world and your service to the nation is what we see out of Hollywood. And I, I, I mean this seriously now. You know, we go to the movies and there's, you know, 40, 50, 60 million dollar productions of intelligence under, under risk, intelligence in danger and all that. What's the level of danger right now to intelligence gathering? Is it just sending drones out, or is there some real risk here to Americans as we gather intelligence in this war? The most significant risk is going to be for Israeli operatives in Gaza, who perhaps might be meeting human sources, but are acquiring uh, prisoners from which they can, uh, they can produce the intelligence. Where are the tunnels? Who's in the tunnels? Where do you store weapons? What's the command and control structure? How do you communicate with your leadership? All of these questions are being put forward, and this is being acquired in a battle environment. So you not only have the traditional threat of working against a terrorist organization, but bullets are flying. Norman, always learn something <clears throat> listening to you. Thank yeah. you, sir. Norman Rule of CSIS. I think we can all agree a positive development here, Tom. Four-day ceasefire, release of hostages. Yeah. Perhaps able to be in a position to do this again sometime soon, but to Norman's point, to Ian Bremmer's point, this is not the end of it, this conflict. And to get the methodology down to do it again, there has to be a first time, and so if you have a second time coming up here after further conflict and war, maybe it'll be easier the next time. There's also a question of, is peace achievable? What does a two-state solution look like? Do people want a two-state solution? Who are the leaders going to be of both nations? Well, because there's a lot of internecine conflict in both uh, Israel and Israeli politics, as well as in Gaza, I think, uh, uh, with respect to the, the <clears throat> leadership there. Mr. Rule took it more granular in forgetting about the diplomacy of two states, three states, five states. It's about who's going to run Gaza afterwards, who's going to provide most basic security, let alone the massive rebuild of Gaza, if that's assumed. A Politico's line this morning, Tom, a brief triumph for diplomacy. Yeah. The president okay. has really lent into this as well, and he's in a very delicate position in this White House with regards to supporting Israel's efforts to destroy Hamas, given the recent pollings, TK, we've seen over the last week or so. Yeah, the polling is, is tangible, and I, I'm sorry, I go back to, you know, election 101, which is foreign policy in October doesn't matter. You get out of Labor Day, you go to October, John, first Tuesday of November, nobody's talking about Israel. They're talking about emotional stuff, including the culture wars in America. That'll be an overlay on top of it. In about two hours' time, we'll be talking about the economy. Jobless claims just around the corner. Neil yeah. Shearing of Capital Economics is going to join us. I think this is kind of the data point of the week so far. Fed minutes, total snooze. Guess what? <laughs> They're going to proceed carefully. I saw some great takes on that yesterday. <laughs> As opposed to what? Proceeding yeah. recklessly. <laughs> We're going to you proceed know, recklessly. What, what does that even mean, Bramo? Proceed carefully. It means they're saying nothing, which is exactly what we expected. And basically, the market's like, well, OK, great. That's what you got for they're us. They're going to proceed carefully, TK. I got 16,000 on NASDAQ 100. You know, I, I, everybody's ma making it up as they go. It's all there is to it. No We're, Fed speak for a whole week. And we are thankful. Tom, I didn't read the minutes. The I'm proceeding carefully. Speech. The delays at Newark. For that. <laughs> John, Thank you John. For that. No, it gives me something to talk the about. The delays at Newark aren't as bad as they were 20 minutes ago. Keep us updated, Tom. Thanks. This is important. Yeah. Middle town of Gulfstream's ready to go.
Live from New York City, here's the price action. The scores look like this this Wednesday <coughs> morning. Equity futures on the S&P 500. A lift here, positive, after snapping a five-day winning streak in yesterday's session. Up here by 0.2% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, up by 0.3%. We'll talk about NVIDIA and some blowout numbers that aren't being rewarded this morning in just a moment. Let's turn to the bond market. Snapshot of treasuries and a curve right now. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year, 10-year. 437. Yields have been grinding lower now for five consecutive sessions. We're down about two basis points. Here's the good news. Yesterday, down about two or three basis points. Monday, down about a basis point. There's a theme here. Lisa, low single-digit moves in the <coughs> Treasury market. I think that exactly that to quote Tom, it's how it's moved down. The fact that it's actually been a gradual decline rather than these dramatic swoons or leaps that we've seen in the yield. And if you see <coughs> that, is this stable? Is this something that we can... We've got some stability on? here, Bramo. TK, maybe. I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm look, look at the market this morning. I mean, we're going into this season where it doesn't go down. People are window dressing. People are, like, looking at the news flow and, you know... People are turkey dressing. NASDAQ up three tenths. Uh, people might be percent. distracted looking I'm at I'm a little distracted right now. No kidding. I mean, let's go to it. I mean, <laughs> no under surveillance, we've got to start with this. Oh, John, boy. you're going to love this. Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart stuffing, Italian bread only. Okay. That's it. You have to dry the Italian bread crumbs the day in advance. I've never done that. Are you going to be doing this today? I don't know. I have Wonder no. Bread. No. He's, not, no, he's I, not taking wait. a flight. He's watching the flight patterns, Oof. and he's not cooking. But, but this is and critical. Watching, like, she, do you know store. what Wonder Bread is? No. You, you yes. didn't grow up with Wonder Bread. No, what is that? Wonder Bread is a white, spongy... I mean, help me here, Lisa. It's, it's, it's like kids' It's bread. basically like um, inflated plastic <clears throat> that you can eat. <laughs> so you I can like basically that. That's accurate. Do, do they slice it for you? It's, it's pre-sliced, it's packaged, okay. and then basically you can mush it into different shapes yeah. if you want to, if you want to eat it that but way. But that's the distinction, John. I'm making my stuffing with Wonder Bread, and Martha's got Italian. So it's like Play-Doh. <laughs> Except that yes. you can eat it. But that would be edible accurate. Play-Doh. Play-Doh. Okay. Yeah. Let's get to foreign exchange. No idea where that was going. The euro was pulling back just a touch yesterday. Two days of it now. We're negative 0.1%. Small move there, though. We're backing away from August highs on the euro against the dollar. <coughs> 10903 TK on that currency pair right now. I'm not talked about enough is the ascent of sterling. 125.32. I mean, over the last X number of weeks, what was it? 119, 116. We were getting down there. And I mean, I'm sorry. It's been an actually constructive pound sterling around the underestimation through all of 2023 of the resiliency of the United Kingdom Might be getting economy. some tax cuts a little bit later as well. Yeah. Just for our audience in the United Kingdom, you will have full coverage of that, led by our team out of London. I believe that starts in about 45 minutes' time. Oh, good. That's the story of the FX market, Tom. We need to talk about jobless claims in about two hours' time. I think that's absolutely critical yes. for this market. Just to go back over what we've been talking about over the last few days or so, there is a difference between a welcome loosening of the labour market and an unwelcome deterioration in the labour market. And Tom claims is going to be part of that story in the weeks and months to come. Yeah, to me, the research item, to, and when we talk, talk and listen and read market economists, is what is that four-week moving average number on weekly claims? And, and the answer is, A, I don't know where it is, but we're at like a 220. And is it 250? Is it 280, a worse, higher number? Where's the trip point there to get to that unwelcome? I take your point. Just in general, when is that trip point where it becomes no, no. something that suggests a nonlinearity and a greater weakness than just a Goldilocks kind of soft landing? I mean, we're nowhere on non-farm payrolls. We're nowhere there. No. Yeah. Two Fridays away, I think, non-farm payrolls. No, a but with a survey number, we're nowhere near... An equivalent claims number of, say, 280 or 300. Yeah, I didn't nowhere mean on the that. calendar, nowhere near it. I That's meant okay. sort of like, you know. Why don't you do an it is, Two garlic cloves minced. Under surveillance this morning, here's your top story. A ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war. Hamas agreed to free 50 hostages from Gaza in return for a four-day ceasefire with Israel and the release of 150 Palestinian prisoners. It'll be the first pause since the war began in early October, with Israel saying the pause in fighting will be extended by a day... Elisa, for every additional 10 hostages released. We have to just start by saying, honestly, if this happens, what wonderful news to get the hostages <clears throat> home, children, babies, uh, and, and get them back with their families. Also, how great to have the bombing stop for the children's and fam fa children yeah. and families in Gaza. Where does this leave the conflict? What happens during those one, two, three, four days? How fragile is it that it potentially gets broken down? And then how do we end this? The, the video we just saw, for those on radio, house-to-house house searching by Israeli forces, and I would go to where General Kimmett was yesterday with Bloomberg, John. It's just about 
every house step by step, and that's an ugly war. It's a really rare positive development in the war of the last six weeks or so. Got to turn to the most tedious story of the year so far. Fired Friday, hired by Microsoft <clears throat> Monday, back at OpenAI on Wednesday. Sam Altman returning to the company he founded just days after being fired, after nearly all of its employees threatened to quit if he wasn't reinstated. The company also agreeing to overhaul its board with new directors, including former U.S. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, who, of course, is a Bloomberg contributor. Is that the final chapter of this, Sarko Bramo? Or is there more to come? My favorite was that the graphic couldn't catch up to what you were saying because it was just so many different things in different moments. It's happened so quickly. It's happened so quickly and that sort of speaks to where we're at. Is it the final chapter? No. To me, this is not the final chapter because what is OpenAI? Is it a nonprofit? Is it not a nonprofit? Have you looked at its corporate structure? It is very difficult to understand. I, I, and then there are these highfalutin aims. Is there a concern about the safety of artificial intelligence? Oh, Have they resolved that on. concern? This is about a new clarity of Microsoft developing, I believe it's two chips to catch up and beat NVIDIA. That's all this is about. It was laid out 10 days ago before all this Altman soap opera. They're just out there, everyone, Amazon, Google, all of them are just trying, uh, Mark Benioff at Salesforce. Sure, yeah. I don't even know what he wants to do. Trying to recruit, that's what he's trying to do. But, but the answer is this is about Amanda. catching up to NVIDIA on this, what, what Satya Nadella told Emily Chang is a mega business. Well, let's get to NVIDIA. Shares turning positive. <clears throat> After another strong quarter, which saw the chip maker's revenue comfortably beat estimates, the company also announcing new chips designed for China, saying U.S. restrictions on exports to the country could negatively affect income into next year. The stock now positive by 1.3%. It's a 240% plus gain year to date. Uh, Lisa, it's amazing these numbers that come out of this company. It's like a kid who gets A+. Plus. And then they get like an A and people are disappointed and they're, you know, why didn't you get the hundred? You know, I mean, that's kind of how it feels. I keep going back to that Julian Emmanuel line from Evercore. And this was before the release of these numbers. <clears throat> In the near term, great isn't always good enough. That's yeah. what it felt like yeah. after the close yesterday. Yeah, I want to finish on Europe. Over in Europe, the ECB is warning that sluggish growth is threatening to amplify risk to financial stability posed by higher interest rates. The ECB Vice President, Louis de Guindos, speaking to Bloomberg after the release of the bank's biannual financial stability review, saying markets are too optimistic. This is one of the main risks, because now you know the, the, you know, the outlook that uh, markets uh, are taking with respect to the to the you know the evolution of the of the economy uh, you know i would say i would say that it's a little bit uh, sanguine <laughs> and uh, so optimistic and there is a little bit of wishful thinking a sober message coming out of a central bank tk a bit <clears throat> of wishful thinking over at the ecb and lagarde writing heard with the bundesbank two percent as well i don't hear any navel gazing about two to three percent here at the ecb they got, and they can do this because supposedly they have a lower nominal GDP set than the U.S., but there is a distinction here on where we're heading. These guys aren't celebrating. Yeah, That's absolutely. the takeaway, ECB, BOE. Yeah. Catherine Mann yesterday. <clears throat> I missed that, the please, Bank of England, please, This please. week, Treasury Select Committee, talking about more interest rates. She'd like to hike even more. Oh, yeah. That is like yeah. the hawk in developed market she central is, banks she, right now. And what's so important there with weak global GDP, Ella Bruce Kasman, is Dr. Mann has... It literally invented the codependency thinking between China and the U.S. So she's uh, hugely qualified on a global uh, basis. Also qualified is Neil Shearing, chief economist at Capital Economics Group. Neil, let me just cut to the chase. Are we going to see global recession? Depends how you define a global recession. I think if you look at most definitions, it's global economy grown by kind of less than two and a half to three percent. I think by the uh, year on year. By the time we get to the first quarter of 2024, I think we probably will make that meet that definition. Yes, but of course it's all in the definition, and it, it depends on which countries you're talking about. Uh, and really, the key point about recessions, I think, is this element of reflexivity. So you get weaker demand feeding into higher unemployment, that creates another feedback loop, loop into weakening <coughs> demand. That's only then broken by central banks or governments loosening policy. I think that's a very real prospect in Europe and indeed the UK, perhaps less of a, a, um, less of a threat in the, in the US, perhaps a bit more 50-50 in the US. 
Uh, but certainly, I think we're going to be entering 2024 on a substantially weaker footing. So let's talk about, Neil, <coughs> the way that central banks could end up getting involved, given the fact that ECB's Luis de Guindos was talking about the elevated chances of some sort of financial accident with high rates and a slowing economy. Will there be a trigger that will force much bigger, deeper cuts to rates, both in Europe but as also in the U.S.? Or do you think that we're going to be able to just sort of have this glide path that people are currently ma mapping out? Well, I think it's possible in the case of the US. Uh, I think the situation today is far more analogous with the situation after the Second World War, uh, where you have this enormous supply disruption and then high inflation. Uh, that is the case that then there's comparisons with, say, the 1970s, which some people have made. Um, so if you look, if you take some comfort from that, it's that um, inflation was high for a few years after World War II, but then came down quite sharply in the late 40s, early 50s. And that would mean that central banks would have some scope to, to loosen policy. I think that's far more plausible set of circumstances, particularly in the US, than is perhaps the case in, in Europe. Now, what would cause central banks to loosen policy? <clears throat> it's possible that some kind of financial crisis event might occur. Um, but if you look at the response to SVB uh, in the US, if you look 12 months ago, the LDI crisis in the UK, uh, that didn't deter central banks from hiking interest rates. They they used their open market operations to, to, to ease financial market tensions, but they didn't loosen policy. So it needs to be a pretty catastrophic crisis, I think, for them to be forced into really, really loosening policy. More likely, I think, is that we get cyclical downturns, particularly here in Europe, probably yeah. also in the US too, uh, and that, that leads to some, some loosening of policy from probably the second quarter of next year. One of the key sort of aspects behind this is why we've seen disinflation to the degree that we have so far. Is it because of simply year over year comparative uh, kind of uh, data points or is this because of some of the tightening that's already uh, come to pass? In other words, is that downturn going to be disinflationary enough for central banks? This is the great counterfactual, and it's the thing that we're always up against in, in macro, isn't it? Is okay, what would have happened had central banks not have tightened? Then my guess is that actually inflation would have come down anyway. And that's not to say that monetary tightening has had no effect. I just think it explains a relatively small part of the disinflation that we've seen so far. Most of the disinflation we've seen so far is about the unwinding of those pandemic-related distortions, particularly on the supply side of economies. Uh, and the, the, the economy kind of becoming... The, the, the demand supply within the economy is becoming closer in equilibrium as a result. Neil, thank you for that. Neil Sheeran there of Capital Economics. Just to extend what Neil's talking about there, TK, of the disinflation we've seen so far, it's just about a rebalancing <coughs> led by the supply side. Then what's in store <coughs> for 2024? It's why some people think that the damage that's going to be done by higher interest rates is still in our future. And we haven't recognized it just well, yet. Yeah, it's the phrase I hate, long and variable legs. So you get out the damage to, uh, you know, 4th of July of, of, of next year. But the supply versus demand side of the economy is fascinating. And I don't really know uh, what to make about it. We got two issues here. I got Bruce Kasman and his team at JP Morgan really thinking about this. And Kasman's got a first half global GDP shockingly under 3%. Really stunning, 2.1%, John, doesn't get it done. Or do you take an IMF stance, which is out to 2028? Pick your gloom, but you got short-term modeling and long-term modeling that's challenging. Brace yourself. NVIDIA doesn't care. Deep breath. Up next on this program, <clears throat> we'll be talking about open AI with oh. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence. We'll also throw in some NVIDIA earnings in the mix as well, so hopefully we can avoid... <laughs> Kara, so popper of the could, last few days. What did Kara have to Kara say? Kara Swisher, a long tweet. It's fabulous. A demented goat rodeo. I think we're all on board with that. <laughs> I think we're all on board with that. What a mess. Perfect. It's just, you know, it's what it is. Man. Tech journalists pulling all-nighters, trying to figure it out, Bramo. <clears throat> they can sleep easy now. Yeah, have it's, we figured it out? No. <laughs> Still trying thing. to work out why it was fired in the know. first place. Exactly. I know, it's absolutely ridiculous. The latest from Bloomberg Intelligence, Mandeep Singh, coming up next. Equity futures right now, just about positive 0.1%. <laughs> Live from New York City, this is Bloomberg. We're here today to announce the Treasury Department's historic action, the largest enforcement action 
in Treasury's history against Binance. It deliberately undermined its own sanctions monitoring controls, and it failed to report suspicious transactions. The Justice Department is requiring Binance to pay $4.3 billion in penalties and forfeitures. That was U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland announcing a record fine on cryptocurrency exchange Binance for violations including ignoring sanctions and a failure to report suspicious activities. TK, one of the biggest players in this space and another one bites the dust. Did you see this coming? I did not see this coming. You've been talking about it for months. I've been talking about this is going to happen, but I did not see this coming on a Thanksgiving uh, Wednesday. Ken Rogoff, my book of the year five years ago, The Curse of Cash. Professor Rogoff got legitimate death threats off that book. And it's about what Raphael Auer at Bank of International Settlements has talked and talked and talked about. It's about criminal activity. Which raises this question, if the first two biggest exchanges for cryptocurrency have both been right. implicated in some sort of fraud, well, you know, what else is going on? And I just wonder, and, especially given that some of the uh, payments for certain terrorist organizations were facilitated on these exchanges. I'm not going to mince words. Team surveillance and pharaoh has been a pinata on this, is we have been skeptical about this ballet from day one. And I was shocked. I did not see this coming. And I was shocked yesterday. They must have evidence on this guy. I can't it's inappropriate to comment on it. But I was stunned at a $4 billion wow. fee. Well, Merrick Garland standing there with Secretary Yellen. Ken Rogoff looks like a genius this morning. So, Tom, what's next? I don't, I, I, what's next is I hope there's some sobriety among institutions. It takes long to do this. But what is the institutional value of crypto. It's not for me to say what it is, but everyone has to study that with a new humility. I don't think it goes away. I think it goes towards traditional players. Isn't that what's next? You stop talking Aren't about we have ETFs. You start to stop talking about Binance and you start talking about BlackRock a little bit more. I, I, what does BlackRock do? Do they want to be associated even tangentially on an ETF to what we witnessed yesterday? I don't know. To John's point, the fact that you've seen Bitcoin hold in its value as much as it has, despite some of this Fair. news, Fair. points to a stickier, more institutional, less yeah. day trader type of audience, which means no. it has a very different type of use and investment case than maybe some of the earlier prognostications. And could well go towards stronger hands. I hate to use I the phrase, the adults in the room, but, you know, that's a phrase that will be I, used. I can't disagree with you, but I just think that, you know, we... We have led on looking at the research and seeing what smart people think about this, including Professor Rogoff at Harvard. Let's move on from that, and there'll be much more on that. Look to crypto on Bloomberg Television uh, for that. Uh, what, what are we going to talk to Mandeep Singh about? Not stuffing. I take your We've pick. Like eight you can things. have NVIDIA. Open AI or NVIDIA. <laughs> which, which would you which like one? to go with, sir? Uh, to be honest with you, I'd prefer to talk about NVIDIA because I think it's more material to, to Let's what's Let's do that right now. Mandeep Singh joins us here on N NVIDIA and what we saw yesterday. What is the legs on this, Mandeep? I mean, you know, we all get the moonshot and units and the fervor, and I saw the 240 percent, blah, blah, blah. Do you look at it as a three-quarter thing, or can it be a 30-year thing? I mean, look, we are witnessing the biggest data center expansion right now. And data center uh, IT market was about, you know, 8 to 10 percent grower historically. And, and when you look at the numbers that NVIDIA is printing, clearly there is insatiable demand. Yes, they will be affected by China restrictions, but... Uh, they're still undershipping demand, and that was the message. And this is a near monopoly at this point of time. The question that you have to ask yourself is, will it remain a monopoly like Intel was over the last 25 years in the CPU market, or will there be more players that can develop chips? And right now, you know, the right. uh, customers that are buying these chips are very concentrated. It's the hyperscalers that are buying, you know, 50% of NVIDIA's capacity. Will they continue to do that, you know, right. for the foreseeable future? Okay, That's well, question. you know, you're an expert on this, and I guess Altman's back at OpenAI. How long does it take to make a competitive chip? Well, so that's what NVIDIA has showed, that they can pivot much quicker. They can ship uh, products much quicker than anyone else. Look, AMD and Intel have the capability to make a GPU, but it's not as... Uh, productive and efficient as an NVIDIA GPU is, and that's what, uh, you know, we are seeing. That's why I say it's still a monopoly. And until you see proof that companies can train as effectively uh, their models on uh, alternative chips, uh, I, I think NVIDIA 
will continue to have this kind of ASP growth, which we saw last time. Mandeep, one aspect of the earnings report that I thought was probably most interesting was the drop off they signaled in Chinese demand for their GPUs, for some of their products. And this comes at a time where they're still able to beat expectations on revenue. They can still ship those chips elsewhere. What does that tell us about both what's going on in China, but also more broadly, what's going on with just the glut of demand? Yeah, look, there was certainly uh, some pull forward in China because they anticipated these restrictions and you could argue NVIDIA was probably over earning in that region. But there is that demand, you know, that uh, they can ship their chips elsewhere. And that is what gives, uh, I think, the confidence that this company is way ahead in terms of not only just developing a GPU, but bundling it. They highlighted networking is a $10 billion run rate business. Software is a billion dollar run rate business. They have the perfect mousetrap right now in terms of bundling these chips to train large language models, and that's huge. All right, so uh, Mandeep, we were talking about OpenAI and not trying not to talk about OpenAI and the relevance of that to this story. How much is there a relationship in terms of Microsoft's desire to create some sort of rival chip with respect to the AI development more broadly and what the future is for OpenAI as an independent agency? Yeah, look, uh, OpenAI and NVIDIA are the face of generative AI, you know, if you think about the trend that has played out this year. And uh, I, I think with OpenAI going through this turmoil, Microsoft uh, driving those changes has steadied the ship. But I would be surprised if they can, you know, uh, ship out the next version of GP, uh, GPT as quickly as they intended to be, because uh, there will be some talent loss as a result of this. And uh, I would... I, I think Sam coming back to open AI may drive some people out. And, and I, I can't imagine things will go back the way they were last week. What do those people actually do, Mandeep? I'm serious. Do they sit at a desk with, with what? A Sun Spark station, a Mac? What computers in front of them? And are they doing the coding like the coders do at Bloomberg? Is it just as romantic as that? I mean, uh, look, this uh, generative AI wave is built on a transformer model, and uh, that is built on, you know, ingesting large amounts of data. There is uh, a human feedback element to train these algorithms and put those guardrails. And training is a constant process. That's what we learned from NVIDIA last night, that you're not one and done with training. You're constantly training your model. That's why you need the GPUs and the data center build out. So, there's a lot that's going on in terms of understanding the algorithms and then obviously putting the guardrails to make sure the, you know, the results are correct. Amanda, just a final question from me, and certainly I would never criticize Satya Nadella. I think I've said on this program and in the last 24 hours, one of, if not the best CEO in corporate America. But clearly some missteps along the way here, Mandy. What do you think the lesson of the last week will be for him and for Microsoft? I mean, when you make a $13 billion investment and, you know, take a 49% stake in a, a company, you take a board seat as well so that you know what's going on. I think in this case, they were blindsided by the developments. And he mentioned that. And clearly, I, I think uh, that was the lesson for Microsoft here. Mandeep, thank you, sir. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence. We've said a few times, Tom, this is not the way someone like Nadella does business. But a clear misstep, I think, on Microsoft's side given what Mandeep just said. And the little bit I read about this this morning, they're saying this is a Microsoft victory. I'll let you explain how. But I, I do agree the shock of this within the niceties of the foreignness of Seattle and Silicon Valley, I mean, I mean just... It's a victory because they're going to win no matter what. I mean, that's basically how it's going to work. They have a 49% investment. They win regardless. In this case, they get more control. They preserve their investment. And, oh, by the way, their AI capabilities have just been highlighted for three straight but days. But there's different the AIs, who have been right? Up all night. John, there's They've different slept. AIs. I mean, there's ChatGPT. I get that. Sure. And Microsoft has Copilot. But, like, is Mark Benioff's AI need the same as Satya Nadella's? I don't think so. What's amazing about this, to Lisa's yeah. point earlier in the hour, we still don't know why he was fired to begin with. And we're still trying to find out. I still don't know what a large language model is. I mean, you know, I... Well, you got some reading to do this weekend. I just, that, seriously, i got to read in on that. That'd yeah. be good. Watching paint dry. That bad? Yeah. Okay.
Coming up, Jack Caffrey of JP Morgan Asset Management. That conversation just around the corner. Equity futures on the S&P 500. Positive here by 0.1%. This morning, we will have some important economic data. Jobless claims in America. 8.30 Eastern time, about 94 minutes away. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. You know, we think that eventually these interest rate hikes are going to have to bite more. I don't expect the Fed to cut rates until the second half of next year. Maybe the Fed is done. The notion of higher for longer, I think, is somewhat being lost on investors. The economy moved slowly and inflation has come down. Personally, the Fed had very little to do with it. There's also a chance that inflation, you know, doesn't fall back to one and a half, that it gets stuck at two and a half or three. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. We are thankful for equity market returns. We're choiceful. Live from New York City this morning. Oh, no. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market positive by 0.1%. The bulls added force in the last 24 hours. Bank of America, 5,000 points. The target year end on the S&P next year. <coughs> RBC, Laurie Cavasina, 5K year end next year. Tom, month to date, the Nasdaq 100, up close to 11% in November alone. Yeah, the acceleration's there, and again, the acceleration is there this morning. I'm looking at some of the luxury stocks, by the way, doing well. And, you, you know, I wonder if it's a China pickup or it's all the excitement over NVIDIA and that. But people are recalibrating, reassessing. And, there's John, I would say there's this numbness, not to November and all to December, the Fed meeting there as well, the year end. There's a numbness about the complete total mystery of January and February, what it's going to be like. I'm numb to the returns of NVIDIA. <clears throat> to the sales growth. We're talking about another double digit percentage beat, Bramo, on a name where the bar just couldn't get higher and they still keep skipping over that bar. They keep skipping over it and people are unimpressed because they're not skipping over it even more. They're not even actually doing better than people previously expected, which raises this really concrete question and sort of this existential question for the rally we've gotten year to date, which is how much growth have we baked in that is or is not <coughs> achievable. What are we pricing well, at this point when you see some of these gains? The fancy existential question is simple. Are we going to see breadth coming out of 74, 75? We had a moonshot lift and then we paused. And, you know, maybe we've paused here and, you know, coming off of October uh, last year. But how do we get to a 1977 lift out to 1982 is the analog. And I don't think you can do it with the magnificent five, six, eight, 12, whatever it is, you need breadth. And that's the money question. We've called NVIDIA the magnificent one, the number one performing stock on the S&P 500 year to date up more than 240%. It's important to this market. It makes up about 4.6% of the NASDAQ 100. It's the number four weighting. NVIDIA's the number four, four weighting on the NASDAQ. That. Also, I think number four weighting on the S&P 500. <coughs> What's important to this wow. economy is the data point, Lisa, that comes at about 8.30 Eastern time. How quickly, it's 90 minutes away. Uh, yeah, how quickly the labor market is going to roll over and that's really the key question we've been asking it all morning which is what's the distinction between a Goldilocks slowdown and a more protracted kind of downturn I will also add to that is disinflation good for corporate profits is that good for uh, for employees if they're not seeing the commensurate wage gains and we're seeing that in some of the earnings that maybe it gets a really kind of to be a complicated picture we should point. revisit a question we've asked in the last few weeks the labor market no longer a reason for this Fed to be hawkish is it now becoming a reason for this market to be bearish. Are we at that inflection point? How close are we to that with jobless claims? Michael Collins was saying he thinks that we are much closer to that inflection point than risk assets are pricing in. Most people who have come on this show have pushed back and said we still see people grinding through this, getting to 5,000. People are feeling good. The sentiment surveys are coming out positive. And that seems to be where we're at. Very soothing there, Bramo. I have to say, <laughs> if you've been away for like three, four, five years and you looked at where claims were, they're still incredibly low. But it's the trajectory. And we've been talking about that. And the fact that you've seen unemployment rates go up to the degree that they have, it has never happened that way, <clears> where there isn't another more nonlinear jump up. And I keep using that word. Is this time different that we're not going to see that? 
that. That's what people I are just, grappling with. We got to have some Bramo gloom the day before Thanksgiving. That was you some know, soothing gloom, though. Soothing. The deliveries changed. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> I'm trying. The deliveries to changed. Wait Less of a fire brand, you know. It's Let's turn Monday. to the scores. Equity futures just about positive by 0.1% on the S&P 500. The bond market shaping up as follows. Muted moves. In one direction, mm -hmm. sure, over the last five days, yields lower. But Lisa, they've been small moves. We're down by a couple of basis points on a 10-year. Which I think is the important point. Is this the new normal? What we're watching, as you said, at 8.30 a.m. and the U.S. initial jobless claims, very important to see uh, whether they inflect up further. 10 a.m., we get the uh, second read, the final read on the University of Michigan sentiment survey. I'm watching the 5- to 10-year inflation expectations, which surged in the previous survey. And, of course, we've been talking about all morning the conflict, the war between Israel and Hamas, and we have received news, which we all welcome, of the idea of hostages being released by Hamas, being returned to Israel as soon as Thursday, as soon as tomorrow morning. Uh, the question is, yes, this might lead to a ceasefire for five days, but after that, then what? It's a rare positive development that I think we're all happy to see in the last day or so. With us around the table, I'm pleased to say, Jack Caffrey, Equity Portfolio Manager at JP Morgan Asset Management. Morning, Jack. Good morning. What do we need to see to get this rally to broaden out into next year? Well, I, I think let's break this down into three steps, if you will. The holiday rally is certainly very much in force. As Tom just mentioned, it's, November has been a really good year. I think it gets to context of what most people would have been putting forth as an idea of what to expect. Um, you know, with the end of, say, tax selling, with the return of the corporate bid, with earnings actually now being positive year on year, you have the ingredients of the next, call it month two, three, of things being able to, I think, move a bit higher. You know, turning to what gets you a broader market rather than an extraordinarily narrow market, I think is A, I hate to say it, we stop kicking the can down the road in terms of what a continuing resolution turns into. How do we actually get some clarity on what federal spending might look like for a long enough time that we can then just worry about the election rather than how we're going to finance the election and our government? Um, and then I do think you're going to have a, a continued tug of war between the earnings outlook and the multiple where what happens in bond markets becomes really important. It's interesting that the first thing that you pointed to was the political calendar in 2024. Is it that important for you? <sighs> Equity markets want to find something to worry about. And to the extent no. that most economics students chose to stay away <clears throat> from political science for a reason, we wanted to pretend we understood the math um, rather than understanding the psychology. And uh, what we come back to and, and, and where you know, I actually have a degree, quote, a formerly in political economy, and at that point in time, I'm like, why? I'm like, well, I kind of think government writes the rules under which the economy operates. So it would help me to understand who's writing those rules and what they're going to set them up to be. So, you know, paying for all of it kind of matters. Jack, what do people do that have single digit returns this year? You've been doing this for ages. And there's those certain years where we're all behind. How do you catch up? I'm trying to figure that out because I'm behind this year. Well, you got three to be minutes, quite so give us, give us the <laughs> answer. We want an answer now. Oh, okay. Well, I should have bought a lot more NVIDIA. Um, would have been an important thing, but it yeah, doesn't really fit it. in a dividend growth mandate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think ultimately it comes back to that question of broadening, um, A. And B, I think, you know, if you look at a strategy, earnings were supposed to be down this year. They wound up being up. I, I, dividends are up mid-single digits. You know, you can find portfolios of stocks that have dividends that are up low double digits. Do you fault big tech because they don't pay big dividends or establish double digit dividend growth? I don't think you can fault big tech for behaving in a way that they're rewarded. So to the extent that you can have companies that are valued on a price to sales basis, what everyone is telling you is we're not actually asking you to have earnings. So to the extent that you can have an entire, you know, almost 30% of a market which doesn't have to manage itself, from an earnings perspective to a consistent cash return to its investors, um, you know, those management teams are going to do what they've done yeah. and continue to do that. I think you know, dividends offer a real check on earnings and a real return of investors and let them decide where to reinvest. Lisa, NVIDIA, drowning in debt. 1.1 percent. Well, this is a cash flow uh, just bonanza, right? And at what point are we pricing in a potential continuation of the pace of acceleration of that cash bonanza into the future? How do you even game out what we're pricing in, given some of the moonshots we've seen? You know, NVIDIA today reminds me a lot of Cisco in the late 90s as having been that 
defining stock that somehow sat in the middle. So what Cisco was to the internet and the completely network world, everyone hung on what John Chambers would say at 401, where he would shockingly manage to beat earnings time after time after time. And ultimately it came down to when his customers ran out of money to keep buying his servers. NVIDIA now sits in that particular position where they can sit there and look at the capital spending of Microsoft, of Amazon, of Alphabet, of with some reworked chips of what China intends to do in AI, what certain countries in the Middle East seem to be doing um, in order to actually build up their own AI equivalent. And you'll come back to at what point does the investments those other people are making start actually becoming more challenged. You know, what's different now versus the 90s example, where I have to admit there's a difference, <coughs> Cisco's customers were all debt financed. And so what the Fed wound up doing, draining liquidity, taking down the concerns and the flood of liquidity for Y2K, for people who remember ancient history, is very different than an extraordinarily powerful <coughs> base of very profitable cash flow generating companies, which to, for the most part aren't being asked or pressed to return cash to their investors. In some cases, thanks to dual voting stock, that they're not ever going to be pressed. This to do is that. a fascinating point. In other words, it's how long do the customers have open pocketbooks and plenty of cash? And their customers have big open pocketbooks and massive quantities of cash. So how much can you see the moonshot continuing in some of these names that we didn't appreciate uh, perhaps at the beginning of the year? Well, I, I think, you know. Wall Street loves an easy story to understand. AI is conceptually really hard to understand, but if everyone wants to do it, everyone is going to keep spending. And, and certainly right now, you know, the cost of capital is higher, but it's still not all that burdensome against a longer term history of what money should cost um, to the extent that the companies which are really driving that spending either have access to a blank check if you're in China effectively from state financing or, or personal financing um, and, and ultimately coming through. But, you know, when you look through why are people somewhat disappointed in NVIDIA, I think this morning it's, oh, OK, that's all you've done for me. Like, meh, what's double digit? What's, a, you know, effectively a 200 percent gain year on year? It's tripled in revenue in a year or something. It's, it's kind of nuts. <clears throat> It kind of speaks to being a unique company in a unique place and time, but that comes back to at some point, what have you done for me lately? And that's where we are this morning. Lisa, I think investors also, they sort of gravitate towards stories they believe are divorced from the cycle because they don't want to talk about the cycle anymore. And this is one of those trends that you can just see out beyond a recession a year, two, three, four, five years down the road. Well said. It also doesn't necessarily well, have the cyclical feel since we're looking right now at something that is a moonshot in a very yeah. specific slice of history and has the dominant uh, dominant footprint. Yeah, quickly, Jack, I'm, I'm, I'm calling the, the bull market the income poor Yardeni bull market, two fossils from the past like you and, and, and me. You. And the, the answer here is, is this a legit bull market and are we at a 77 analog where this is the second leg of a bull market? You got a lot of scared people over at JP Morgan, don't you? You've got some really enthusiastic people. You've got some really scared people. That's the beauty of having. Is it the second leg of a bull market? I, you know, we've had a great year this month. And if we go back and look back two years, we're still down 2%. So, you know, we haven't really re-entered that bull market because we're still not back to highs. Um, to really make the sustainable highs, you actually need more people playing along than what I call the sacred seven, not the magnificent seven, because I'm trying to avoid theological belief in terms of, of growth rate. Um, but I do come back to, you know, what we had was a good growth quarter. It seems like we got that because the inventory supply chain finally got fixed. Companies could actually fill the orders. Right. And right now the concern is, well, orders are seemingly drying up a little bit because you don't have to double order anymore because you yeah. actually get your stuff. John, did you see this percent change on the standard of ports 500? <laughs> Looking at it now. Year to date, we're up big time. Month to date, up something like 8%. Eight Amazing. On a session at the moment, we're positive by zero. 0.2%. Jack, you and I have had the privilege of talking together for a long, long time. I just wanted to squeeze in your call on housing because you've had some interesting calls associated with that part of the economy. What's the call now? You know, it's certainly last several months my, my bias has been we're living in the renovation nation. The idea that, you know, with an 8% mortgage rate, people are almost trapped. It's concept trapped in your 30 year mortgage at two and three quarters percent. The shame, the shame. Um, but you're certainly going to see, I think, some freeing up of housing activity. I do think that comes back to 
you know, will the bond traders finally be right and we start getting some rate cuts next year rather than this permanently high plateau that the Fed is talking about, which kind of reminds me of Irving Fisher about 1929, um, except now it's bonds, not stocks. This was a clinic. Jack, thank you. Jack thank Caffrey you so much. Of JP Morgan Asset Management and happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. From New York City this morning. Good morning. The war itself being over would require the eradication of Hamas as a, as a threat to Israel. This operation right now uh, requires that they remove more civilians who are under significant threat. So this war has, uh, has weeks, if not months, to go forward. That was the brilliant Norman Rule there, the former senior U.S. intelligence official. From New York City this morning, good morning. Equity futures pushing higher by 0.2% on the S&P. Just want to lock our attention on crude just for a moment. We've got WTI here down by 1.8%, $76 and about 40 cents. We're going into OPEC plus weekend, or at least we thought we were, Lisa. Talks scheduled for the weekend may be delayed, according to delegates. Have you got any idea as to why? There was some talk about Saudi Arabia being dissatisfied uh, with other members and oil production goals. I don't have any intelligence beyond that. That's what we're reporting uh, here at Bloomberg in light of some of the potential delays. But here's the question. Do they need to cut more? And the idea that we're going to be talking about that, even with geopolitical risk, really highlights how much oil has been a missed call. And I'm, I'm going to overlay on that the Bruce Kasman call of the next six months, 2024, being a 2.1 percent global GDP. I don't have the model in my head or on an Excel spreadsheet, but I'm suggesting that's oil south or at least not up would be sort of the guesstimate there. You know, credit to the Saudis for cutting production when they did. Seriously. Uh, they were criticized at the time, but looking out to next year, we are all talking about decelerating growth. It was kind of the right move, wasn't it? It was, and I think that they're feeling probably pretty justified, especially in light of some of the criticism. How much of this is decelerating growth and decelerating demand? How much is U.S. production, which is ramped up at a dramatic pace? <clears throat> and that's going to be really a key question that a lot of people are trying to understand also. Or you could say they shaped the events they anticipated by pushing crude prices into the 90s. So, you know, <laughs> pinky poison, but the latest so far from reporting suggesting that talks scheduled for the weekend may be delayed. This according to delegates and crude at session lows off the back of that. Brent at about 80, 76. WTI negative by, let's call it, Tom, 1.8%. Very quickly here, John, do we get a lift in the markets here? Is this like the signal for the end of the year? I mean, we're in the holiday season. I think it's, you know, I think we can all agree, even with the distractions we have of December 13th. But just, you know, it's just like I got money. What do I do? Is what did Jack Heffrey say? Yeah, I listened to every word. What a year November's been. Yeah. and Huge gains this month. That's about it. And you can see Jack Heffrey out on digital. We'll get that out to you as soon as we can. This is a joy, in a way from the horror of the Eastern Mediterranean, to have Aaron David Miller with us is wonderful. He wrote a book in 2014, which ought to be reissued this morning. He's senior fellow at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And Aaron, with respect to our president and to take your wonderful book here on the end of greatness. I want you to describe how you perceive any given president, but in this case, President Biden, with Mr. Netanyahu. How should we interact? How should our president lead, dare I say, Israel to a better future? That's a very good question, and the president's been roundly criticized by just about everybody, with the exception of the Republican Party that has sort of emerged as the Israel can do no wrong party, for not restraining Israel from not cracking down on the exponential rise in Palestinian deaths and the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. You know, I mean, I, I'm, uh, you know, a pithy of the Oracle at Delphi, reading the best of golden trails, can't tell you how this conflict is going to end. But I, I, I will say one thing is predictable, and that is Joe Biden's response to this crisis. For three reasons, his persona, the fact that the presidential model here is Bill Clinton, though a generation apart, both of these men have this preternatural love, I would say, I use the word intentionally, for Israel in high regard for its security. The president reacted to October 7 in a powerful speech on October 10th, which set the frame for his reaction. The second is politics. You have a deeply divided Democratic Party, progressives, and even mainstream Democrats, some of whom are calling for uh, more restraint. Um, 
but again, uh, 2024, I don't think the president wants to leave himself vulnerable to Republican charges that he's weak on Israel. And the third, third P, persona, politics, is policy constraints. The fact is, Biden doesn't have any better answers to the three cruel dilemmas that the Israelis face. Number one, right. prosecute a war uh, against Hamas and eradicate it in a densely populated urban area without endangering and killing large numbers of Palestinians. And then what do you do about the day after? I don't think the administration right. has better sense in the Israelis. Aaron, you know, I look at the collective memory lost, and it may be as far back beyond 1948 or certainly 1967. We have a youth of America that seems removed from our collective memories of the Eastern Mediterranean. How do either political party corral the youth of America towards an understanding of America's effort in diplomacy in the Eastern Mediterranean? I think it's virtually, given the generational divides, uh, identity politics, the sort of asymmetry of power where the stronger party, regardless of its motivations or context, is perceived to be the Goliath and the smaller party perceived to be the David, I, I'm not sure that's, that's possible. I mean, I would argue public service, but then again, I'm old and um, uh, probably out of touch with, uh, with this generation. You know, when it comes to foreign policy, I think George Will was right. For most Americans, and I think even for young Americans, they want, to, they want as little of it as possible. So the fight, the struggle, the focus is here at home. And um, I worry about that young generation. I have two 40-year-old kids who I think are committed to trying to leave the world a better place. They are interested in foreign policy. Um, my bias has become theirs to right. a degree. I think it's hard. It's really hard. Lisa, I'm depressed when somebody young is 40. Okay, can I just well, let you know that? But, Aaron, I am curious how you see this evolving in terms of we've been all talking about what uh, some sort of humanitarian pause or ceasefire or whatever you want to call it, a cessation in fighting for four or five days to allow the hostages to go home to their families, to allow uh, for humanitarian aid to enter Gaza. What does that lead to? Do we have a sense of what different camps want after that? I think that's the, you broke the code. I think that's the key, key question. Is what we're witnessing within the next 24 hours when uh, 50 uh, Israeli women and children will be released, hopefully three Americans, including a, a three-year-old that about to celebrate birthday. Uh, is this a headline or is this a trend line? Hamas took prisoners for two reasons. Number one, to trade them for asymmetrical uh, number of Palestinians released from Israeli jails, 150 in this trade, because this resonates deeply in the Palestinian street. Hamas also took hostages in order to constrain uh, and um, delay an Israeli ground campaign. The hope is that pressure will mount. A four-day pause will turn into a six, seven, eight, ten-day pause. Pressure will mount for what Hamas really wants, which is an extended and prolonged ceasefire. Uh, that is going to be extremely problematic for an Israeli government that seems to have no intention of stopping its military campaign. But pressure is going to rise, and we have two clocks ticking. The Israeli operational clock, which is ticking much slower, weeks, perhaps months. Uh, Biden and the international community's uh, political clock, which is ticking much faster under the human pressure of the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza, and the exponential rise in Palestinian deaths. Uh, seems to me uh, this situation is going to get worse before it gets much worse, I'm afraid. Back-to-back -back clinics on this program in the last 30 minutes. Aaron David Miller there of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Just phenomenal. Some of these conversations, Lisa, just need to get home and go back over. Stay to play. Hamas has agreed to free 50 hostages from Gaza in return <coughs> for a four-day ceasefire with Israel and the release of 150 Palestinian prisoners. What you just heard there, though, is that could be the starting point for a bigger push to get a much longer ceasefire as the pressure begins to build, continues to build, I think most people would argue, <coughs> on the Israeli government. And what Aaron David Miller said there about two different timetables, the Israeli government having uh, perhaps weeks and months, and what we hear from President Biden in a very different political calculus that's a shorter calendar highlights the tension that must be underpinning some of these discussions. Yeah. And I would go to Robert Hormatz yesterday, both there and David Miller and Ambassador Hormatz, saying, look, we got to look in the mirror at the state at home. For Hormatz, he's written about this for at least three decades, if not four. It's about the state of the federal budget and, you know, the debt and deficit here. 
How do you prosecute diplomacy and defense if you're distracted by a debt and deficit? Just to extend yes. the analogy just a little bit more, it's not just that the clock is ticking. I think for the president, the alarm went off over the weekend. Given that poll we saw out of NBC <coughs> News. Stunning poll. Yeah. Equities right now on the S&P positive by 0.2%. Coming up next, Earl Davis of BMO Global Asset Management on fixed income. For once, so far, got no idea if it changes. It's a bit of a snooze in the bond market. Jack Caffrey, JP Morgan with the line of the morning so far. And good morning to you. What a year November has been for this equity market. The Nasdaq 100 up by 10.6%. Best month since January of this year. The S&P 500 month to date is up 8%. Best month since July 2022. We had some weight to it this morning. Up by 0.2% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq up by 0.4%. Even the small caps participating, Tom, up by 0.2%. 0.5%. Moments ago, the VIX pricing at 12.99. You can price it now, John, at 12.98. This is coming down. That's a bull market VIX. The ten, to, for history here, John, rarely we get to a 10 level on VIX. And trust me, 12.98, we're almost there. I mean, we're, we're sure. on the edge of nirvana. We've joked all year that equity <clears throat> investors are trying to make bond market calls. I don't think they want to try and make bond market calls. They just don't want to look at the bond market. And the good news is that over the last five days, you can kind of ignore it. Treasuries right now, two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Let's sit on a 10-year. And I'll go through the intraday moves over the last few days, Monday through <clears> Wednesday. <throat> Monday down a basis point. Tuesday down two or three basis points. This morning down two. Finally, for now, I know, I know for now it could change. But Lisa, have we got some stability in Treasuries? It seems like it. Can you bank on it? I don't know. Lori Calvacino, we've been mentioning her outlook all, uh, all morning, but she said that the greater appeal of bonds, just because of the higher yields, may end up being a dampener of U.S. equity market returns, but not necessarily a derailer of them. And it seems like bonds might be a dampener of uh, some of the appetite for risk assets, but not a, a deal killer. And that seems to be the case, mm -hmm. unless things get out of control. And that's are, the reason why volatility Are we matters. out of control with West Texas 75? We're going to get a 79 handle on Brent at any uh, moment. I mean, the disinflationary tendency of hydrocarbons here is tangible. We'll get to crude in a second. You know. I just want to round it up on what's happening in Treasuries. A month ago, so it is November 22nd, and your tenure is 437. On October 23rd, your tenure was 5.0187%. Yeah. That was the highest cycle. So it's been a big turnaround in the last month, a move <clears> of <throat> something like 70 basis points or so. That's the story of bonds. Tom wants to talk about hydrocarbons. Let's talk about crude. Session lows down on WTI, down on Brent by almost 3% now. This off the back of a headline that talks scheduled for the weekend well, might be delayed, according good. to delegates. So we'll be able to go to Vienna. I think Manus is going to Vienna for us. Really? See, good. Yeah, Manus That's is going to do good. some Manus okay coverage for Team us coverage. out of Vienna. Lisa, the crude market's reading it one way. I have to say, sitting here, I've got no idea how to read this, but certainly crude is down by something like 3%. Maybe the idea here is that there are certain delegates that don't want to cut production. I'm not sure exactly what the uh, rationale here is, but how much have we gotten this wrong? How much do we not understand the move in terms of is this demand going down or is this production in the U.S. offsetting some of the cuts that we saw from Saudi Arabia? Or is Arabia? it the memory of 1986 where OPEC was simply OBE, overcome by events? And I, I really, I, I, I don't know what to do with the J.P. Morgan global economy of 2.1%. I don't know what to do with that. That's, that's an original statistic. We'll return to that, Tom. I want to get you some top stories. <coughs> Under surveillance this morning, Hamas agreeing to free 50 hostages from Gaza in return for a four-day ceasefire with Israel. Israel will release 150 women and Palestinian prisoners under the age of 19. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowing the war will continue after the ceasefire and Hamas will be destroyed. Your next story, Sam Altman returning as CEO of OpenAI <coughs> just days after his surprise firing. That's the story that we've seen dominate the news flow over the last week. The company also naming a new board of directors, which will likely include representation from Microsoft, the company's largest backer. The maker of ChatGBT facing immense pressure to rehire Altman after nearly the entire staff threatening to resign. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella endorsing a move after offering to hire Altman for a new in-house venture. Microsoft Lisa up by about 1%. I think we've all said it. 
Satya Nadella more than unimpressed over the last week. I love that in his interview with Emily Chang of Bloomberg, he was so controlled and he was very much just seeming to be, uh, you know, displeased with the fact that they were not informed before this move was made. But they were reviewing the situation. I wonder if he was incredibly animated in some of these calls and if he's gotten on the phone with other board members and saying, can you tell me what in God's name happened that this happened? I mean, because he doesn't even know. But, but the, the summary here into Thanksgiving and the staggered a Monday is all in all, this is a win for Microsoft? I mean, it's up a stick now, I get it, but... Mandeep Singh's really pushed back <clears throat> against that. Yeah. And I know we're all, I don't know, I'm asking. We all celebrate the success of Satya Nadella, but I want to go back to something Mandeep said. To take an investment in a company this large, to own 49% of it, Tom, to have that 49% stake... And not know what's state, going on? And not know what's going on and not have a seat on the board is a misstep from Microsoft. We can talk about some of the brilliant things they've done <coughs> how nimble Nadella has been over the last week, how he's yeah, managed the situation disagree. with Grace, but disagree. that was a rare misstep from Microsoft, which really materialized in the wrong way for them. The coming days on that will be interesting. I, you know, I don't, is it over? Can we like move on from I've got no AI, idea. We're gonna get AI, some grand story about what they think AI, happened, and yeah, I, I hope we move More open AI. I, I hope we can talk about things like Nvidia a little bit more, turning positive in pre-market trading after an earnings report which blew past Wall Street expectations. We've talked about that a million times this year. We can do it all over again this morning. The world's most valuable chip maker forecasting revenue of $20 billion in the upcoming quarter with the average estimate sitting at just under 18. Despite the upbeat report, NVIDIA expecting new export rules to China will cut into its income by this time next year. The stock turning positive. Lisa, I keep returning to that quote from Jim Emanuel <laughs> over at Evercore. Where is it? In the near term, great isn't always good. And I read that going into the report and then I watched this drop yesterday, saw the stock price reaction and just thought, Julian, nailed it. This is an overachieving child and basically everyone is trying to figure out what more can you do for me and basically they came out and they said look this is really good and everyone's thinking yeah you could do better and that's Were you an overachieving child? This feels personal. Is that what happened to Bramo? No. But I'm really Co not college degree. No, in two let, and me, half let me years. just tell. Let me just tell <clears throat> what you. What else have you got? Post grad. <laughs> let me just tell you, I am not an overachieving chef. So let's just uh, set the bar there. We can discuss that. We're lowering the bar going into Thanksgiving at Casa Bramo. That's what just oh, happened. Oh, the so. bar just is on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> we could order it afterwards. Uh, restaurant is the way to go. Rest, it just yeah, you said that a few times. Yeah. You know, it's it's why it's, not? I, I have huge respect for both of you. Uh, in getting through this. This is a really important conversation right now. It was important 30 days ago, but it is important into 2025. Earl Davis has had a fixed income, BMO Global Asset Management, and I can't say enough about the controversy of his call that Jerome Powell will stay the moment and keep rates higher for longer. Earl, do you stick with that call? Uh, 100 percent. Uh, and, and that's one of the things we're looking at in the market now uh, in regards to how many eases are being discounted for next year. We see, you know, we're on our way to 100 basis points of eases uh, by the end of next year, which we think that, you know what, uh, you know, I always believe the market, but um, in regards to the pricing at the moment, but it's right. our belief that you know, they'll be firmly on hold next year. You're out of Western Ontario, the land of perfect statistics. What's the correlation of your Fed call your higher for longer call to the equity markets? Oh, that's, that, that's a, a great, great question. Um, you know, the, the higher for longer doesn't matter to the equity markets, you know. Their discount rate's the long-term rate, right? The 10 to 30 year real rate. So uh, what happens on overnight won't impact, uh, um, won't impact equities unless they do ease, then it's just a euphoric uh, buying of equities. But from a quantitative perspective, it's the 10 to 30 year real rate that matters for equities. When we talk about the 10 to 30 year rate, we were talking yesterday with Michael Collins of PGM Fixed Income. He said he could see a material further decline in real yields just based on the fact that people are expecting this growth to continue and that he thinks we're seeing the signs of more material slowdown. Do you agree? I agree eventually. Um, I think the real rate of state elevated for a while as long as the economy remains resilient. I know we're getting mixed numbers, but the economy overall is still doing well. You know, less and less calls for a recession during 2024. As long as we have that, real rates will stay high because that's the counterbalance to the economy doing well. Uh, you need to drive, uh, take money out of the growth economy into the savings economy, which is real rates, and to fight inflation, which, you know, it seems like people have forgotten. You get part of fighting that is keeping the real rate high.
So in other words, you're saying you don't think that the slowdown that we're seeing on the margins is enough to bring inflation lower and that currently the nine tenths of a percentage point decline in benchmark rates, the cuts that people are pricing into the market next year are overstated. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say two things. It's not necessarily the slowdown that we're seeing. It's the pace of the slowdown. Is growth declining fast enough? You know, there's still a lot of excess demand uh, in the economy. I see it when I still go to the stores and, and restaurants. Yes, it may be savings, it may be credit that we're seeing at retail sales, but people are still buying. That is excess demand. That's a big driver of the growth in our economy. And that's what, what leads to inflation. Um, so I don't see it on, on that part. Um, on, on the inflation front, you know, we're getting constructive numbers, but we are still very worried about wage inflation and that passed through yeah. into in pricing. It's right where I wanted to go. You really center out wage inflation. How 60s are we? I mean, the idea of, you know, you know, forget about cost push, demand pull, and the rest of it. Is it just plain and simple wage inflation that we remember from 40, 50 years ago? I, I think we're getting there. The difference between now and the, the 60s or 40s and 50s years ago is the amount of unionized employees. You know, it's significantly lower now than it was before. But that trend is increasing. And what happens when that trend increases, and we're seeing the wage increases, UAW, UPS, you know, you look abroad in Canada as well. What happens is um, the people who are non-unionized have to get rate wage increases. And we saw that with Honda and Toyota. So we're not quite um, 60s, 70s because we're not as unionized, but that trend is increasing and uh, the wages will, will remain a pressure on inflation. And I think it leads to secular higher inflation, you know, 3 4 percent instead of 2 3 percent. So what's your highest conviction, Earls, heading into next year at a time where people seem to be moving in the opposite direction, celebrating soft landing, celebrating maybe the return to the old normal? Where's your conviction lie? The highest conviction is that there's no eases until at least Q4. Uh, so that means just by uh, shorting two-year bonds or any part of the curve, you own, you make money if nothing happens because the overnight rate's still five and a quarter. And, you know, we saw where uh, ten-year bonds are right now, right? So that's negative carry trade to own those versus overnight. So highest conviction trade is, is uh, no eases, uh, Fed on hold till at least after the election. Wow, Fed on hold until after the election. Oh, that runs counter to a lot of people. <clears throat> uh, what do clients say when you tell them that? Well, first I tell them following a winner is a loser's game, you know. So when, if we try to follow what the crowd's doing, we're always coming in second. So we, we base our views on tailwinds, on fundamentals, on quantitative numbers. Um, and that's what gives us, that's what has proven to be successful in the past. We just show our results and, and we say, what's our marker? So for example, where would we advance our eases? Where would, do we start believing what the market's saying? For us, the key number to look at is unemployment rate above 4%. As soon as it gets above, then, you know, I think the safety's off, <laughs> off so to speak, <laughs> in regards to eases. We're not even closer. We're at three seven still, so we still have a ways to go. And I think the Fed would like to see it closer to four five before they start easing. Um, so that's our trigger, and that's what we tell clients what we're looking at and what will help us change. And and they know our results, and they know this is the most volatile year in fixed income, and we're outperforming in it. It's nice to get an original thought, Earl. We appreciate it. Earl Davis there of BMO Global Asset Management. No cuts until after the election. That's quite a call. If you're just joining us, welcome to the program. Equities on the S&P 500 shaping up as follows. We're positive by 0.2%. Yields are coming in about three basis points, 436. Lisa, I don't know what you think about that. No rate cuts until after the election. That is so counter to the <clears throat> expectations right now. Just to give you a sense, people are pricing in almost a full percentage point of cuts by next year, by the end of next year. He's saying they're not going to do it because they don't see the weakness, they don't have the conviction. The political aspect of this is one of the most unspoken aspects. How do they justify a cut that could be perceived <clears throat> as something that could help the incumbent yeah. versus not? How do they remain that independent? Does it save the banks? I find that fascinating. If you get an Earl Davis call, total outlier call. Do they want cuts or hunts? With great respect the, to the banks want. Record. I'm not sure what the banks want, other than either. they'd like 2023 to end. He said line of the sand was 4% <clears throat> unemployment, and maybe the Fed wants 4.5. I think we're about 3.9 at the moment, Bramo. So this goes back to the labor market. Exactly. Yes. Again, which is yes. why we're looking yes. at claims yes. Yes. at 8.30 Eastern time. Which is why this is why everyone should be watching on the day before Thanksgiving, is for claims that really will give us a sense of the trajectory going forward and whether that call is I'm going to take call. it so seriously. I'm going to leave the set and go back to my Bloomberg at my desk and, and watch claims come in. That's what I'm going to do. Are you, you're going back to start cooking. Or, you know, you got I need to start cooking in? a little bit later, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Somebody emailed me in on creamed onions. Martha's got creamed onions down Creamed cold. onions, okay. Yeah, it was 16 Next up on this leaves program, of sage. This is the only reason I'm here today is the following segment. The next one. We're going to catch up with Madison Miller on the potential impact of a Zen pick on Thanksgiving. That's all I'm here for. It's my favorite topic. That's right a now. shot, this right? It. It's yes. not pills. Yeah, it's a is. shot. Get some shots, TK. Yeah. People are microdosing a Zen pick. You hear about that? Oh my God, really? Microdosing a Zen pick. Oh, someone told me about that. Yeah. Wow, Just that's new. Little shots. <laughs> I think some of the speculations around how it impacts uh, the food industry and, and uh, you know, the drinks industry is perhaps a bit exaggerated. Uh, but I think it, it underlines that for the first time we really have a, a, an efficacious way to address weight. And many patients have been trying to lose weight in all kinds of different ways, have not succeeded. The blockbuster drug of 2023, that was the CEO of Novo Nordisk, the company behind Azempic, speaking to Bloomberg earlier this month about the increasing popularity of appetite suppressing drugs. Prescriptions skyrocketing 300% from 2020 to 2022. Food manufacturers and retailers preparing <coughs> for the potential impact as we enter the holiday season. TK, this stock up in Europe by something like 49% year to date and knocking LVMH off his perch for market cap in the continent in, in over Europe, the last few months. Yes, yeah, just so amazing. It, it's got like FDA approval, obviously. Somebody must have approved. It's a shot. So like, it's got, where are the competitors? I mean, if this is that successful, NVIDIA is like a six year plan to make a chip. Come on, you put the chemical, they all copy the chemicals, Novo's right? in the mix, Lily's yeah. in the mix, Bramo, there's a few in the mix. Yeah, yeah, there are a couple of them. The real distinction here, and, and to the point of how much of an impact this is gonna have in the broader food and drink industry is, how are people taking this? Are they taking this medically in order to uh, produce the obesity epidemic or are people doing this recreationally to try to achieve a look? No, I mean, I'm serious. <laughs> this is actually a serious concern. I or, think the answer is both. Right. Yeah. So then, you know, at, at what point is it sustainable given some of the side effects? Sure. And at what point is it medical? And are we conflating the two in a way that sort of exaggerates the effort, or are we underestimating the desire in our society? I, I, I've for been a really unhappy aspect? with the coverage because I just don't think we're looking at it as a medical story. We're looking at it as a money story, uh, you know, shit, the shits and giggles stories, if you will. You know, people like me make Choice jokes words. about it. No, well, Maya Marie was here, she trained me. But, but the answer is that, that, that really importantly here, are we talking about this as a medical story? Oh, Tom, it's a I money story because it. it is a medical story. And such a large slice of GDP in this country <clears throat> is healthcare. We're talking about this country, Tom, pushing 40% obese. 40% of the population, more than a third obese. With That's this, what we're talking about here. And if you don't I, I think that's a money that. conversation, then uh, I, I think okay. you're on another planet. Of course it's a money conversation. I, I get the obesity story of America, but as Lisa mentioned, what are the side effects here? Do we well, that we it? need to get into, without a doubt. On the branding, <clears throat> what I think is interesting yeah. here is that we're all talking about Azempic. We don't even really know the names of the other drugs. It's kind of like search engines. We talk about Google. You don't talk about Bing and Yahoo Thank Search, God. do you? But this is it now. There's Bing no vote already won just by the very nature of the conversations yeah. we're having about these food suppressant drugs. We we're, just call them universally <clears throat> as MPIC. Right, exactly. We're going to inform you now after 3,000 calories tomorrow. Joining us, and she's cut and chiseled out of the Ryan Fieldhouse at Northwestern. Madison Muller joins us right now, where everybody at Northwestern is all, you know, nobody's taking a Zempic at Northwestern. Madison, there's a lot of jokes, including from clowns like me. Get serious here. What's the downside to a Zempic? Yeah. I mean, as you guys were just discussing, it is, it's really important, medically speaking, I mean, that this country does have a huge problem with obesity and obesity affects over 200 other chronic conditions and, and different conditions. And so the impact on health and healthcare and, and just prevention of disease is enormous, but there are downsides. I mean, people have side effects like nausea, vomiting, different stomach problems, you know, varying degrees of severity. And that's something that the drug makers are really focused on working out right now in this next generation of drugs is figuring out how to make weight loss drugs with fewer side effects. Um, because for some people, it is a deterrent from using them. Madison, some of these drugs are aimed at diabetes, some aimed specifically at weight loss. They contain both the same active ingredient. Is that just marketing or different amounts of that active ingredient? What, what is that? 
Yeah, so in Novo Nordisk's case, so Ozempic is the drug for diabetes, and Wagovi is the drug for obesity, and they are different dose strengths. Wagovi, the obesity drug, is a higher dose, it's stronger. Um, and for Eli Lilly's drugs, we have Monjuro and Zepbound, which was just approved earlier this month. And in, in that case, those drugs are the exact same dose, exact same active ingredient, you know, virtually no differences between them besides the marketing. And, and it is for sort of uh, commercial, commercial purposes in that case. Do we have a sense, Madison, of how many people uh, are taking the drug, of how widely uh, spread this is expected to be in terms of dissemination and whether people are taking it more for medical reasons or more for just pure weight reasons? That's a, that's a good question. I mean, I think that that's something that we are still trying to figure out right now in terms of off-label usage and how, how much that's happening. I mean, there are a lot of people are using these drugs who do have obesity and who do have diabetes and they're seeing incredible benefits from it. That's, you know, undeniable that these drugs are totally life-changing for people um, who need them. And there are also people that are using them off-label more, but the drugs are exorbitantly expensive. So the, the costs sort of prohibit uh, widespread usage right now unless you are able to get the drugs covered by insurance, which is sort of spotty. It's not really there's not widespread insurance coverage. Medicare still doesn't cover weight loss drugs. Um, so it's sort of, it's an interesting scenario right now. But we are seeing projections that this market is expected to grow to 100 billion by 2030. And that's, you know, only a few years off. So it's growing rapidly and there's a huge addressable market here. How much of a push is there to get insurance to cover this? And how much does that really factor into the pricing, considering the fact that ostensibly we're trying to parse the difference between obesity and uh, medical issues like diabetes, but there's a lot of associated side effects to also uh, being overweight. So there is a question here about what the distinction really is and whether some of the other costs start to go down as well that would prompt insurance to really be forced to take this up. Yeah, that is the conversation that is playing out right now. Insurance companies are still, in a lot of cases, unwilling to cover these drugs because those real cost estimates haven't come out yet. And that's something that the Congressional Budget Office is actually looking at right now. And they're asking for more research, more data on the, you know, prevention and, and you know, how much money the country will save actually in using these drugs and, and preventing future disease. Because, like you said, there are so many other related conditions. and. Just a couple of weeks ago, earlier this month, we saw at the American Heart Association conference in Philadelphia, Novo Nordisk presented data showing that uh, Wagovi cut the risk of heart attacks and strokes by 20%. Um, and that's huge. And so we're seeing already these studies, and there are other studies coming out about sleep apnea and knee osteoarthritis and um, NASH and different related conditions, you know, chronic kidney disease, to see what the, the real impact is and what other conditions we might be able to ward off by using these drugs in people with diabetes and obesity. Forgive my reaction to that, Madison, but every time I see those headlines from those studies, I kind of sit down and I'm like, well, yeah, duh. Like, didn't we know that yeah. already? Madison, what is yeah. revealing about any of that? I mean, some of it is to be expected that when you reduce weight, when you control blood sugar better, it will have these sort of knock on health benefits, that's to be expected. But there's also something going on, um, you know, that we've talked about that there might be this added extra benefit. There might be something going on with the drugs themselves that they're having a positive impact on the heart. Because in these studies, we saw basically from day one that there was an improvement in heart benefits with people that were taking the drugs, sort of regardless of how much weight they had lost. You know, that was, these benefits were seen from the get. So there's something else going on, and that still remains to be seen what exactly that is. Um, but there is these incredible benefits that we're seeing just beyond weight loss. And it's it's also showing that obesity is is a real disease. It's not a lifestyle condition that is, you know, some what some, you know, can be controlled just by what someone's eating. Um, there is it's a it's a real medical issue. Madison, thank you. Fantastic contribution. Madison Muller there of Bloomberg on what's happened with some of these blockbuster drugs this year.
Lily, that stock is up by something like 62%. Nova Nordisk up by something close to 50%. That <clears> issue, Tom, heart disease, the number one killer yeah, in this country. There's no question, heart disease. Yeah, no question about that. Uh, I'm also looking at the literature out on the web, which is this is $900 a month. And what happens when you stop taking it? So is it basically a $900 a month? What is that? $9,000 a year? Plus, I can't do the math. It's, you know, Wednesday. But $9,000 a year and you're in it for life? Well, you know, there are a lot of questions around the longer term and the short term <clears throat> side effects. And this is something that people are going to be studying. The bottom line is the fact that weight loss drugs are currently being thought of and experienced in such a concrete way has changed the conversation in the same way that artificial intelligence did in the tech world. And that, I think, is going to be a game changer. Well said, Bremer. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. She's like on her game today. You and I are slacking off. A pillar Bremer's of this economy, killing. a pillar of this economy is obesity. So much of this economy is leveraged to that tragic issue yeah. in America. That's the story. Alberto Gallo of Andromeda Capital Management joining us shortly from New York. This is Bloomberg. of whether we're seeing more consumer weakness, we could very well be. The economy will likely slow down from where we've been, which is a, you know, a, a strong point. We are holding on to that slowdown, but uh, we've been surprised to the upside throughout this year. We are making progress in terms of taming inflation, bringing inflation off of those peak levels. Really, I think we're going to be looking at modest growth next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramlett, and Tom Keen on radio, on television. Uh, lots going on this morning, many different narratives as we prepare for the holiday season. In this hour, the interview of the day, Helene Becker, on how bad it will be, John. <laughs> yes, what you're focused on, is <clears throat> I'm focused on Helene Becker, what's the travel going to look like? Rain here in New York, that being a way, <laughs> I'm, I'm told. But you wonder what trains, planes, cars. Sure. Helene Becker on the airline industry. Tom, absolutely obsessed with the airports he won't be going to in the next 24 hours. You're not even traveling, but it's very Who good of you to be to concerned about it's everyone not, else. Somebody <laughs> said it's going to be the worst in 50 years, and what's important is every plane you're traveling on has an NVIDIA chip. We're getting back to travel, and I think that's the best <clears throat> news. You know, seriously, it's Post great. Post-pandemic, oh, it just is. Move on, yeah. move on. That's it fantastic is. to see. One of the worst performing <clears throat> stocks of the year. And this is not a commentary on the stock, just a commentary on the broader takeaway from right. seeing that stock where it is. Moderna. We're all moving on. That's much, we're, much we're moving better. on from this, moving and of on. course, it is a consumption. And preparing for Thanksgiving is getting the Abramowitz turkey in the new refrigerator. I mean, what's a, it's going it's to be a welcome kitchen this year. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. And it's bigger, so I can really <clears throat> stuff more things in there. Does really damn, when you plug it into the light stem in the rest of the house. <laughs> yeah, we had to generate some Always new a ideas. Small issue. But let me just put this this way. I bought something big, and a lot of other people are buying things that are big, whether it's turkeys or whether it's, it's the in consumption, general. which has the been the surprise of the year. And that's really where I'm focused. I is thought we got one enough to warning about big ticket, <laughs> big ticket items. That's yeah. just true. <laughs> I tried to move against the grain. to contribute. Exactly, which is good. But you know, there there are other things well, that are going off the shelves. But that <laughs> folds into our, that folds into our narrative this Thank morning. You. And you know, Alberto Gallo <laughs> coming up, particularly on the bond and European view. John, I got equities up. I got bonds in. I got oil. On the edge of a crater, and I'm sorry, it's world, it's US, it's everybody at Bramo's house demand. It's Bramo's world, TK, that's for sure. <clears throat> you said Helene Becker was the interview of the hour, data point of the hour's jobless claims, 8.30 Eastern time in about 28 minutes, without a doubt. And we're looking for claims to come down to 227 from 231. It's got to break. It's just started to climb just a little bit. It's got to break yeah. to get to this soft landing baloney, and we're not there yet. And we heard from BMO an hour ago, 20 minutes ago or so, talking about the prospect of no rate cuts whatsoever yeah. until you get through 4% on unemployment and something closer to 4.5. I wonder what that would do to this equity market, Tom. And I'll go back to something I said a little bit earlier this morning. We've said it on this program before. If this labor market's no longer a reason for this Fed to be hawkish, when does it become a reason for this equity market to be bearish? And, Tom, how close are we to that moment? I don't know, but we're breaking down again. I'm, I'm waiting for the 30-year intraday chart to come up on the two-year. You can do this on the Bloomberg Professional Service. John, the two-year yield breaking down near that 4.80 level. We're not there yet, but we're moving in a direction here which gets you away from all the gloom of high rates. We broke 440 on a 10-year. 
in the last 24 hours. We're down another two basis points to 437. Single digit moves, low single digit moves through this week. Monday, Tuesday, <coughs> Wednesday. We've had five days of yields moving lower, including last Thursday and Friday. Your 10 year, 437. Jack Caffrey at JP Morgan. The line of the day, the line of the week, the line of the month. What a year November's been. The S&P 500 up by more than 8% this month. TK, the Nasdaq, up by 10.6% in November. Huge moves, and the Nasdaq up four-tenths of a percent right now. This morning, we had a VIX of 12.XX, 9.8, I think, is what we got to. 13.02 percent. We got a lot for you, seriously, in this hour. And in and, and the nine o'clock hour, John Farrow, Turkey Leftovers, What to Do Friday. Look for that. Wait a second. We call it my <laughs> show. My show at nine is now Turkey Leftovers. <laughs> well, it's a, it's okay. a D segment. It's like the exit segment. We're calling my hour on TV Turkey Leftovers. Yeah, you stand there with a little chef <laughs> thing on in the head. You stand there with I'm a I'm leaving this on. show early. I've gone <laughs> in like five minutes. <laughs> It'll be Turkey Leftovers. He's never oh, had boy. a turkey. Alberto Gallo joins us now. Oh, boy. Yes, with his service to the government of Italy and, of course, his work here with Andromeda Capital Management. What a raging debate, Alberto, on where yields go the first half of next year. What's the Andromeda bet? Good morning. So, as you were saying, there's a lot of happiness, a lot of complacency in the market. And we're again in a situation where we're pricing a lot of cuts from the Fed and the European Central Bank but without a hit to growth. So we're pricing Goldilocks, we're pricing low inflation, central banks cutting, but without so much recession risk priced into the, into the stock market. And this is also because this year we had a lot of shorts in the market. There's still people that are short that are underweight risk assets and it can continue, but we think that rates um, you know, can go up again. Uh, we think inflation is persistent. And governments will have to issue a lot of debt because fiscal spending continues. And you've seen the UK tax cuts, for example, coming today. So fiscal spending continues in the US, in the UK, in the Eurozone. So we're not done here with uh, with the call on duration. You know, we're not done. Uh, we think we're going, go, going back towards, you know, where we were uh, previously this year. Not Maybe not 5%, but we're going back up. We are done over at OPEC Plus. Just to get everyone up to speed on the latest news, there was a suggestion in the last hour that maybe OPEC Plus would be delayed, that meeting would be delayed. We're now hearing from delegates. The meeting scheduled for the weekend has been delayed, Tom, delayed until next week. Well, that's because they can't, they can't agree. I mean, they're getting it out looks front that of way, like, TK. Yeah, yeah, it looks that I way. Mean, there's a why to this. That's the latest then. The meeting has been delayed until next week. 7945 on delegates. We're under breaking 80. down. Under 80. Breaking down on crude in the last hour or so. <clears throat> Alberto, you've got to put money to work. Given what you just said about the Federal Reserve, what have you been doing in the last month as this equity market has continued to rip? But definitely, you know, moments of geopolitical risk, um, moments of fear in markets, like what we had in March earlier this year with SVB and Credit Suisse, or what we had in October, you know, can be moments that provide opportunity for tactical investors. So we put a lot of money to work in October, and um, the uh, we, we put a lot of money to work the whole year. But particularly in these moments, you have these locations that can be pretty useful and. Um, the markets are rallying. There's more room to run for credit. Uh, it's an environment where equities, you know, are, are expensive, and you know, wages are growing. Corporate profits are okay, but everything is priced in. You've seen Nvidia yesterday. You know, it surprises to the upside in terms of earnings, but stocks, stocks can't surprise, can't reprice more than they already have. So credit is offering today yields that are double digits, and that's you know, in in the high yield market for companies that are relatively large, and sometimes they also have shareholder support or government support. So these are high quality trades for us when we have good margin of safety and we're looking at new issues in corporates, in banks, in defensive sectors, in sectors that are resilient with high interest rates uh, to, to pay us that kind of yield, you know, double digit yield, uh, which is a pretty, you know, pretty juicy premium uh, over treasuries. And that's that's pretty attractive to us today. Today. That was a really interesting uh, note that it was today. There is a question and a tension underpinning this complacency that you talk about with pricing in Goldilocks and then leaning into what's been working. When do you push back against the sentiment that has been the driver and the winning driver year to date of returns? Well, Lisa, this is a great question because obviously 
Um, you know, we do think that stock markets are a little expensive and rates markets are pricing too many cuts, but going into Thanksgiving, going into the holidays, um, and with a short positioning in the market, especially in rates, um, it's sometimes hard to, you know, to take the other side. But we do think that in Q1 next year, uh, issuance, supply will come back, governments will need to issue. Now, this year, there was a lot of retail components uh, that helped governments to fund, you know, even up to 10% of the issuance. Um, as retail investors, you know, went into into treasuries or into you know eurozone government bonds, and next year, um, what's happening is banks are more competitive. Finally, banks are increasing deposit rates, so governments will have to compete with banks uh, for for retail um, for for retail funding. And I think that you know bond yields in the you know five to ten year part of the curve might go up again on on simply on issuance and fiscal spending and we don't think there's a recession coming next year it's just a gradual slowdown um with which means that you know probably the fed doesn't need to cut the ecb doesn't need to cut at least for the first part of the year so there's a lot of positive expectations there that could disappoint a little and uh, and then we'll see volatility again so what's the bigger pain trade right now at least heading into Q1 uh, of next year? Is it economic resilience or is it economic pain? The pain trade is there's still a lot of shorts in the market. Uh, in credit, we see shorts in the CDS indices. There's underweights in equities. So the pain trade is for risk assets to keep grinding into January, into January. And we're seeing it playing now. There's essentially investor that, investors were very hedged and these hedges are coming off into the year end. Uh, but next year, you know, we probably will start with a more um, lean um, positioning with less shorts. So, you know, the market will have a higher hurdle uh, in, in going up, you know, we face a higher hurdle. Um, so we, we are seeing a giant short squeeze, but there's a lot of positive expectations priced in. So we have to be tactical here. The bar gets higher going into 2024. Alberto, happy Thanksgiving, sir, to you and the team. It's great to catch up. Alberto Gunner there of Andromeda Capital Management. The team here at Bloomberg working hard on this OPEC Plus story. Grant Smith leading our reporting. So allow me to share some of that reporting with you. The OPEC Plus meeting is scheduled for this weekend has been delayed. Talks, we're told, running into trouble amid Saudi dissatisfaction with other members on oil production levels. At least the meeting will now take place next week, according to delegates. Saudi Arabia, which of course has been making these additional cuts going back to July, in difficult talks with other members about their production levels, according to delegates. So I don't really know exactly which way to take this. The market's clearly taking this as maybe people are reluctant to cut as much as Saudi Arabia would like, which is maybe the reason why uh, prices are falling. I, I don't know what to make of it, except that this definitely highlights that there is a, a lack of consensus in the same kind of way of what's required. And then also whether to cash in on what you can get out of the ground now or whether to try to well. work together with the, uh, with the collaboration of OPEC Plus. Or, or the underperformance of energy, and I find it fascinating. Brent crude down 35%, the drawdown down 35%, ExxonMobil down 13-ish percent, something like that. And even Aramco, John, you know, directly related to uh, OPEC, Aramco down only 10%. I mean, is it just oil hasn't dropped that much and has, uh, oil stocks haven't dropped that much and have more to go? The mispricing between oil equities and oil itself is a study alone. We're down something like 20% from <clears throat> September, which is kind of nuts given what's developed in the Middle East in the last six weeks or so. If you're just joining the program, the scores look like this. I'll so start with equities and we'll shift over to the commodity market. Equities down by 0.2%. Crude, negative 4%, 74%. Wow. 67. Brent crude, Tom, you nailed it. Break of 80 to the downside, 79.35. Uh, to, to, to 80, and I don't know how much academic visibility or market economics visibility there is beneath. I can't, I can't believe I'm saying this, but it's a 69 print. I mean, I, I, I don't know where we are there because there was such a skew towards greater global demand, 90, 100, dare I say, 110. And you know, to borrow from the economist Walt Disney, it's a whole world after all. Well, I just want to I want to understand better why. Right. Is this demand? We're talking about how everyone's going to be traveling. It's expected to be a record, a new record in terms of traveling uh, post 2019 going out before the pandemic. So where is the lack of demand coming from? Right. Is this just an issue of China or is this just simply supplies well, that the U.S. is suddenly producing in a much more significant way? Yeah, George Cervell is publishing for Deutsche Bank in the last hour and he, you know, the wonderful summary note into the end of the year. 
and he makes clear how lumpy it is. The U.S., I'm not sure there's a collapse in demand, at least yet. The rest of the world, there's some real challenges out there. I'm just going to get to my tease, if we can just get a little Please, bit of time you know, for my tease. Coming up on tear up? Turkey Leftovers, <clears throat> otherwise known as The Open, to people who care about it. Tom, Larry Adam, Raymond James, Torsten Slark, Apollo, Amy Wu Silverman, of RBC. I'm leaving. And Happy cookie, Thanksgiving. Cookie. <laughs> From New York. What are they going to do with turkey? Dark Good meat. morning. Why me? <laughs> <laughs>
And again, I think that's a good thing. I'm looking right now in some prices to a couple of places, and they've come down really markedly. I mean, I'm actually surprised uh, by how much lower they are this time of the year than last time of the year. There was a story on the Bloomberg talking about how airplanes have been actually increasing capacity in response to what you're talking about, the demand from the consumers, but they're having trouble now filling the seats. Are we seeing the shift that could really change the picture in a more material way for next year? Um, I think we are, actually. What we're saying for next year is that domestic is going to be normal, um, whatever that is, but it will be normal seasonal travel patterns, more so than we've seen in the last few years. Um, I call it four is the new three, Lisa. <laughs> Your boss wants you back in the office three or four days a week instead of two or three days a week, so it makes it hard to take that long weekend. Um, kids are back in school five days a week, so again, it makes it hard to just pull them out and go somewhere. <laughs> So we're seeing that more normalized travel pattern in the domestic market. I think what you're going to see internationally is increased capacity because that's where the demand was. So you'll see fares coming down, um, especially in the North Atlantic and the Caribbean, Mexico as well. Those are, are yeah. three of the biggest markets where we see declines. And then we think there will be a shift to Asia Pacific. Oh, sorry, Tom. Oh, no, I, I think this is important, Lisa. You and I have been following selected flights, and I just look at one Newark to Paris. It's what everybody takes, and the answer is it's one third. It's one. It, it's you can fly three people now business class for what one business class ticket cost 18 months ago. Yeah, stunning. I look declines. at Denver theoretically because some of the snow has started and it's really nice. Well, right you now. think it's Paris like, as Denver. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, <laughs> Helene, I am curious as we talk about the potential for prices to go lower, where the breaking point is for some of these airlines. We talked about some of the contracts with pilots with uh, other staff. All the prices are going up dramatically of the work staff. The base costs are going up as well. Put oil aside for one second. How difficult is it to make that break point for some of these uh, airlines as prices start to come in? Yeah, we're going to see margins get squeezed. Um, no choice but to, but, but to raise your revenue. And it's hard to raise revenue because especially in the domestic market, people will opt out. And you can't... I've done this for a long time, as you know, and you can never lower fares to offset volume declines. It just doesn't work that way. And so we'll see margin pressure. And we don't think airlines will make as much money in 2024 as they earned in 2023 as we revert to a more seasonal and normal pattern. Um, I, I liken it to the cargo industry. Look at what happened with FedEx and UPS over the last year and a half or two years. Right. Volumes are down and revenues are not up as much. Revenues are down, costs right. are up, and margins are under pressure. Well, that's Why sad. wouldn't do, that happen? Do you run away from the industry? I mean, I'm trying to get my airline stocks back to where they were pre-COVID. Good luck with that dream. Yeah. Is there a single best yeah. buy or do you just walk away from the sector? It's, it's really hard, Tom, because the stocks are at... 2020 lows or below. Um, our best idea for 2023 was United. Um, we had some good success with that most of the year until we didn't. <laughs> and then um, we really like COPA, CPA, which is Panama based. Everybody thinks, oh no, Panama, but there's actually a lot of really good things. It's a $3 billion market cap company. Um, Panama is a sea level airport, so you don't have the weather related delays. There are a lot of U.S. expats who live there. They rely on the U.S. dollar. They don't have their own currency, so they can only spend what they earn. The canal would be the largest employer, as you would imagine, and then COPA would be the second largest private employer, followed by the airport. So it's a really well-run, well-positioned airline with a dividend, um, around a 3 or 4% dividend yield. And that dividend goes up almost every year as so the family um, the shareholders um, get uh, pay, or the company rather, pays out uh, fifty percent of pre of adjusted net income. Um, yeah. So that's a that's a good that's a good one to look at. A couple of others. Yeah, Helene, yeah. thank you. We are so grateful that you're here on Thanksgiving. Thanks. And I am wondering, are you traveling <laughs> on Thanksgiving? Do you ever travel on Thanksgiving? That's so funny, Lisa. Normally we do, but I couldn't take it this year. <laughs> I've, been, I've been on the road every single week uh, since August 1st. And when I looked at my, all our kids are traveling. They're all gone. My, my, um, my, my son and daughter are together with uh, my son's baby and, and his wife. And 
Um, my stepkids are are visiting their in-laws, so it's like I looked at at my husband. I said, "No, we're staying home, and I'm not eating turkey." <laughs> Elaine Becker of TD Cowan, <laughs> thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, exactly. I'm staying home, and I'm not eating turkey. Yeah. Spoken like a veteran Thanksgiving experience. I look at Copa here, and you know, I get the idea, and, and others have said this is a wonderful, you know, distant experience. Ten-year track record, negative 3.8 percent per year. All it is is Helene Becker's industry, the airline business. It's a tough business. It is so hard, and it's only getting tougher. Yeah. Coming up, we're going to talk about those jobless claims, which I'm excited to do, uh, given the fact that that is going to be the data point, Tom, uh, that we had been expecting. Veronica Clark, Ira Jersey with us, a special guest later on. Bloomberg on a Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Good morning. Bloomberg surveillance, Lisa Bramlitz and Tom Keen. John Farrow, in preparation for the 9 o'clock hour, look for his important segment, Turkey, the day after. We'll have that Friday leftovers. Looking forward to that. Jobless claims. Now, McKean out with us. He's making a five-step cranberry sauce. Oh, is that so? So i got to take the morning off. i got to do the pre-do on that. Jobless claims, and I'm sorry, it's become a big statistic in terms of getting the narrative forward. The high-frequency data highlighting just what might be happening <laughs> under the under the hood when it comes to the labor market. And it, we do get a read, and it comes out 209,000 uh, jobless claims. That is down from 231,000 the previous <clears throat> month, and that is down from the expectation of 227,000. So this was uh, actually a better than expected uh, initial jobless read and fewer jobs uh, being Few lost. Fewer claims, yeah. But then there's this question of small revision upward. Is this good news or bad news? And I know Stuart Kaiser <clears throat> would kill me for saying that, but you have me to too. imagine <laughs> you're going to also kill me for saying <clears throat> that. But at what <clears throat> point is this uh, sort of pointed to resilience that might kind of, you know, challenge some of the rate cut discussions we've been having. An immediate lift to the market here. NASDAQ up four-tenths of a percent. Futures up 12. Don't want to overdo that. The bond market may be a continued churn. I'm watching a two-year yield, 4.87 percent. But we've got the claims and continuing claims clearly indicated in that direction. Veronica Clark to be with us in a moment uh, here to give perspective. And then durable goods, a little bit soggy there. I take a three, John Hotze is at Goldman Sachs taught me to take a three month moving average on durable goods, which is too much math for Wednesday morning before Thanksgiving. But there it is. And, and to be honest, Lisa, the Michigan statistics at 10 a.m. And I agree with you. Inflation expectations there is germane. Yeah. Although I have to say the, the <clears throat> response that we've gotten in the bond market is surprising to me because you actually see yields lower on the day, even though you're getting a better than expected labor market, which really calls into uh, question just how quickly demand can continue to go down and just how much we're going to see a potential risk of at least resurgent prices uh, next year. These to me are some of the questions that I know people are being uh, are asking, especially when you have a full uh, full sweep of better than expected employment data. And the oddities that we have here, uh, so much coming up. Emerita Sen will be with us here in about 15 minutes on the shock of OPEC and oil. Uh, West Texas, $74 a barrel, down 4.2 percent. Brent crude under $80. Emerita Sen in a bit. Uh, Veronica Clark will join us here on the American economy. But first, a snapshot on his outlook for next year. Ira Jersey joins us. He's really helped surveillance this year with perspective. Ira, your outlook for next year. Give us a, a, a capsule of that. Yeah, so, so my view is that the Federal Reserve is done hiking and eventually it will start to cut interest rates. I, I think that the market <laughs> perhaps is a little bit ahead of itself in terms of what it's pricing for cuts because as the minutes showed yesterday, I suspect that the, uh, that the Fed is probably going to be reluctant to cut interest rates unless we have a very deep recession. So in, in an environment like that, you can wind up seeing the yield curve remaining pretty inverted or at least a little bit inverted throughout all of next year uh, with the front end kind of pinned where it is and the long end potentially seeing a bit of a rally. So, so treasuries could have a good year even if the Federal Reserve is on hold because the expectation is going to be for the Fed to cut in 2025 or, or, you know, or even start earlier in, uh, in, in 2024. Ira, I got to say, 
I'm actually really surprised at today's market move, today's uh, the response in markets to an initial jobless claims report that came in below expectations. This normally, in a normal world, should be a positive downside surprise, considering this means fewer people are uh, losing their jobs, continuing claims showing the same trend. Why isn't this being viewed as a challenge to the idea that the Fed can cut by a full percentage point next year and that we're going to see some sort of downturn? Well, with, with you know jobless claims at uh, 209,000, that's a good job market, right? That means people aren't losing their jobs at a quick pace, and uh, so, so you have seen it's not very big move, right? There, there's not a lot of liquidity in the market <coughs> day before a holiday, um, but but you did see two-year yields back up a little bit, right? Maybe in anticipation of the market saying, well, you know, the Fed's not going to hike necessarily, but maybe where the pricing for May and June cuts in next year uh, might be a little bit too pessimistic on the on on the health of the economy. So, um, you know, obviously things like the four week moving average is what I tend to look at for claims because it is very noisy and it is very seasonal. Um, so, so, but, but 209,000 is certainly uh, suggestive that the job market is still reasonably robust. Do you think that the uh, slowdown that we've seen so far, especially given the robust labor market, is sufficient to curtail inflation enough to even get cosmetic cuts that people are talking about from the Federal Reserve? Well, I, I don't think that there's going to be cosmetic cuts. I think the idea that the Fed's going to cut, you know, 25 basis points and try and be really cute and calibrate is not something that uh, is in their standard operating procedure. Um, as I'm more, I think it's much more likely that the Federal Reserve is on hold and then cuts more aggressively when it feels it needs to because the economy is falling out of bed. Um, you know, 209,000 jobs being created probably isn't good for, uh, for for things like service sector inflation, which is still the sticky part of inflation that's maintaining um, inflation well above 3% uh, in, in aggregate. So, uh, so, so I think that, uh, you know, as long as you have a, a, a good job market, it's, it's going to be a sign that the Federal Reserve uh, is going to be on hold. Ira, help the business people watching, including in beleaguered real estate, Tell us the trajectory of the real yield, the 10-year real yield, 2.50 peak. We had Pijamon, I believe, yesterday, and they're really looking for a plunge in the real yield well under 2%. Do you buy it? Yeah, I do. And actually, that is our forecast for next year, that by the end of next year, we'll probably see real yields uh, kind of in the low one handle. So call it one and a quarter to one and a half percent wow. for uh, 10 year real yields. Well, you say, wow, it's 100 basis points. Um, you know, it, I think it's going to be difficult for inflation break even. So so basically the tips gauge of what inflation is going to be versus where, where nominal treasury yields are um, it, to come down much lower than where they are today at around 2.2 percent on on a 10 year. I don't see that going below two. So if we're going to have the rally we in the treasury market, we think we're going to have next year. Almost all of that is going okay. to come from the real yield. Side. Away from tips and trying to make money here, the speculation of it all. Ira Jersey, what does that low real yield mean for the American economy, for business, the incentive to invest? Well, it should actually increase, it should make uh, financial conditions somewhat better, right? So one of the uh, drags on the economy right now, which is which is what the Fed wants, to, to be fair, is to have real yields be a uh, an impediment to very fast economic activity, right? And and that should help to arrest in uh, inflation. Um, yeah, you know, but but even at one and a quarter, one and a half percent, on if, compared to the last ten years, that's actually not particularly high, right? And uh, and it's also not particularly low. Remember, not so long ago we had negative two percent real yields. Um, so so positive real yields. I think in in general is still a sign that the economy is healthy, but maybe okay. not uh, not growing at the same pace that it was before. Got to leave it there. Thank you so much on this Wednesday, Ira Jersey, for joining us with Bloomberg Intelligence to take that over to the American economy. Veronica Clark joins us, of course, a movable feast from a high interest rate regime down to something lower. at Citigroup. If we get that low real rate, Veronica. I would suggest many are not prepared for the incentives that means for the American economy. Yeah, I think if we get that lower real rate, though, it's because we've seen a weakening in activity data. You know, it's because we've had tight financial conditions up until this point because inflation has been high. And at some point, you know, that should weigh on activity. We, we probably do get some type of broader downturn in the economy. And that's then what gets real yields lower. Veronica, this uh, jobs report really speaks to the narrative that you guys have been talking about, which is essentially this economy has a lot more momentum than people are giving it credit for. How much uh, do you think that that story is being ignored in current pricing? 
Yeah, I mean, we've seen an incredibly resilient labor market, and I think for, for the last year, really, people have been trying to, to poke holes and, and explain why the labor market is secretly weaker than we expect it is. Um, but the data have just been incredibly strong, and I think we, we have to trust that. I would worry, though, that you know these things can have some non-linearity to them. You know, we have seen the unemployment rate starting to, to rise, and that could be an early sign that things are slowing down. And it could be quick, you know, when things do slow down. Um, but yeah, so far the data have just been incredibly resilient. What's the connection between a resilient labor market and inflation? Is there any correlation between a labor market that hangs in there and inflation that remains sticky? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think the, the labor market is really the, the fundamental driver of strong activity right now. It's why people are still spending. And it really is the fundamental driver of, of wage growth that really seems you know, to be running maybe 4 to 5% and maybe kind of stuck there. And that kind of wage inflation is, is not consistent with 2% price inflation. That's more like 3 to 4% right. price inflation. Is there evidence that a monetary authority can lower wage growth inflation? Yeah, I mean, sure. By by really weakening the labor market, I mean, you, you we have a you know still an imbalance, I think, of demand and supply in the labor market. You know, the, of, of course, the Fed has been trying to get job openings lower, but they're stuck at something around nine million. Uh, That's come much on. higher than they were pre-pandemic. Veronica, <laughs> come on, you're asking for some gloom recession stuff, and everybody's modeling out this baloney phrase "soft landing." A soft landing doesn't bring wage inflation down, does it? No, no, definitely not. I, I don't think this ends in a soft landing. It's either you know a, a harder landing, something we would call a recession, the unemployment rate rising, or you're just stuck at too high inflation. Yeah, this is the heart of the matter, Lisa. I mean, a beautiful summary there by uh, Veronica of, you know what? You want wage inflation down, as Earl Davis said. You know what? Soft landing doesn't get it done. Which raises this question, either is the market basically overly sanguine that either the Fed is done raising rates or that rate cuts are a positive for risk assets? Veronica, which do you think is the, the way that we're going to end up seeing the market evolve? Are we going to see the Fed be prompted at least to talk about raising rates again or at least hold rates at 5 percent for the remainder of the, of the year? Or do you expect there to be that nonlinearity that we see uh, all of a sudden? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll end in the latter. And the Fed is still trying to talk the, the hawkish talk for now. We saw this in the minutes yesterday, you know, still you know, talking up the idea that maybe they need to tighten more. But I think they probably are done. I think everyone really agrees on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, until you see you know, some slowing in inflation, which I don't think you really get without the, the weaker activity, then yeah, rates will, will stay high. There's really not you know, the, the reason to be cutting. Veronica, thank you so much. Veronica Clark with us with Citigroup there, and we'll look forward to their outlook and their view forward into December as well. Pretty much stasis here. Futures up 12, Dow futures up 33, NASDAQ up four tenths of a percent, Russell 2000 takes off up half a percent. The VIX, I mean, sorry, 12.99. That's what I define as a bull market. You can give me this intermediate bear market stuff. You can't do intermediate bear market with a VIX of 13. You, you look just, at the you VIX, know. and I look at the move index, which is the implied volatility yes. in bond yields, and you're seeing in 10-year Treasury yields, and you can see it's come down dramatically uh, from recent highs, and you've seen that just represented in the lack of extreme motion in the full faith and credit. To me, that's underpinning a lot of the safety that we've seen. On a Wednesday, full faith in OPEC, 74.58 down $3, 4% on American oil. Brent crude slides before 80. Amrita Sen coming up. That's going to be a huge, huge deal. SPX down two tenths of a percent. And we talk all about oil and how it's been the big missed call of the year. It's the big missed call of every year. It seems like we always get it wrong yes. and how much it is tied Which to is weather okay. and the idea of not understanding the changes in supply and demand. But really, in this case, there is a big question, A, about China, how much oil they've already stockpiled and aren't necessarily buying, even if their economy is recovering, right? There's that kind of trend. But then there's also the fact that the U.S. is producing record amounts of oil. How much does that offset some of the cuts that we've seen from OPEC Plus? I, I just think as part of the commodity story, and when I got global demand, I mean, the shock, we're getting all sorts of outlooks in, folks, not even enough time today to go through them all. But the J.P. Morgan, Bruce Kasman, Global Economic Outlook, it's a zillion pages, 15 people put it together. Uh, Bruce didn't do any of the work. Everybody else did the work, Lupton and the rest of them. But the, the answer is, I don't believe I've ever seen a 2.1% global GDP for six months. And that goes to the China statement that we heard from NVIDIA 
that you know, maybe I'm underplaying the slowdown in China. I may be wrong on that. No, I think a lot of people would agree <clears throat> with you, and we have seen this yeah. in earnings reports. It's just how much is the extraordinary outperformance of the U.S. economy offsetting that, right? I mean, there, there are all of these cross currents uh, that are so hard to pin down, which is the reason why oil has been uh, the biggest defier of all market narratives. I don't really understand exactly what this OPEC plus delay really means. I'm really looking forward to talking with Amrita Seth. Huge said. response here. I, I mean, just huge, huge response here to what uh, Pharaoh's cooking up for the 9 o'clock hour. We, you know, we're going to do meatloaf, but he's doing turkey leftovers. Pharaoh. Turkey loaf? Yeah, he's got 11 different ways to do leftovers. For what turkey. do you do? I'm looking forward to it. What do I do? I eat as fast as I can. 12 leftovers. I was wrong. Surveillance correction. 12 leftover turkey recipes. Look for that in the 9 o'clock hour. And Rita Sen next. I do think that uh, there is a concern that uh, we'll see further cuts. Already, the Saudis, Russia have extended their cuts, uh, voluntary cuts, to the end of the year. But we've seen now in oil prices, uh, unlike the product prices, uh, we've seen an absolute collapse in the front end of the curve. That was Stephen Shork, principal at the Shork Group, talking about what has confounded most people this market, which is oil prices at a time where we were supposed to have a slowdown that didn't happen, and then we were supposed to have a war that would boost the price of oil, and it did not. What we are looking at today is a quiescent market, to use your word, Tom. I like that word. It's, it's green really kind of Stole um, from Mr. Green. <laughs> it really gives a sense of sort of a, a lack of drama. Underneath the hood here, S&P futures up three tenths of a percent. Yields just nudging lower every day for a number of sessions in a row. 4.39 percent on the 10-year. Uh, and oil, we are going to get to in just a moment. But oil price is lower by more than four percent on the NYMEX, seventy-four dollars and fifty-four cents. Before we get there, I do want to just bring up Deer. Tom, please, they were, please, please, please. They, they came out earlier with earnings <clears throat> that were disappointing. You are seeing a significant response in the shares, uh, with shares lower uh, by more than 5% at one point, if we can pull it up and take a look. Uh, but what we're looking at is a company that is seeing less demand from a lot oh. of farmers, in part because they already had equipment that they front loaded, in part because prices of crops have gone down. And they don't have the yeah. conviction that they're going to need to plant as much as they were in the and, past. And Dennis Garman would say that, that it does go back to the price of corn, the price of wheat, and, and the rest of it. Of course, deer with a pandemic moonshot, 100 up to three, roughly 350, and then really been range bound here. But I, I take your point here. What's interesting here for Global Wall Street, and we welcome all of you today, is White Sandy Freak, 777 pages. And the companies that they use within that arch accounting textbook are Caterpillar and John Deere, because they can fold in how you pay for the tractors, which is equipment leasing. Yeah. So you can fold right in. And, the, you know, I take the point here. I'm glad you brought this up because it's like FDX. It is a bellwether for the American economy. It's essentially a Boeing equipment without the uh, equivalent without the romance. And if you take it a step further to a point that you've made before, Tom, and I think it's a really important one, that prices are going down and this is weighing on goods. The company on goods yeah. and on the ability to invest in a significant way that nominal price that you talk about how it benefits corporate earnings we're seeing the flip side of that in a disinflationary well, listen environment to you i mean you, you know you're taking the kool-aid and the and the, I listen the to you whole, the whole oh, the good, look, you, you gotta stop doing that i mean <laughs> well i mean i mean listen to pharaoh at least let's listen you know, to i wouldn't, <laughs> let's I listen, wouldn't to listen to me I'm, I'm trying to get there i got it up corn here from the peak Eight dollars a bushel. We're all going to die. And Rita Sen's going. Why am I on? They're quoting corn. We say good morning to Dennis Gartman. Corn down forty-two percent. Forty-two percent. And there's less of a need for tractors. <clears throat> we'll park that conversation for the moment. Oil. But we do want to speak uh, with Amrita Sen on a different commodity, co-founder and head of research at Energy Aspects, as we try to understand what's going on in OPEC Plus. How do you understand the delay that we're hearing about in the OPEC Plus meeting that was supposed to take place this weekend? I mean, look, we was already starting to hear rumors about that this morning. Um, we've also been told that potentially the meeting could be virtual. The timing of COP, uh, which is being held in Abu Dhabi, shouldn't be underestimated because it does really overlap uh, a fair bit with the timing. The ministers have pre-meetings from the 27th, 28th. Uh, but really, the, the, the OPEC Plus, we understand, has been trying 
uh, to push for additional cuts in Q1. Uh, remember, just a bit of background, they already have cuts in place, including voluntary cuts, all the way through to the end of next year for the entire group. This would be on top of, and this would be on top of if Saudi Arabia and Russia were to <coughs> decide to extend their additional voluntary right. cuts, right? But for that, they have certain issues with, like, there are new baselines for several countries next year. UAE gets a higher baseline. The three African countries right. get a lower baseline. That's where the contention is, is the African countries who are saying, you're already giving us a lower baseline, and then now you want us All to right. cut even more from there. That just needs to be ironed out. And Marita, I've got to cut to the Emirates send uh, a wheelhouse here, which is the microeconomics, the price theory of oil. There's a thing called oil demand elasticity, which is the how much do you move when you move. And Marita Sen, can you look at oil demand elasticity and begin to price in $60 framework for oil? I mean, demand's going to be fantastic in those prices. I mean, look, even at $100 oil prices today, if you look at it versus 2014 levels, that's only equivalent to about 70. 2008 levels, it's like in the 40s. So, you know, inflation-adjusted oil prices aren't even high, even if they were to be $100, let alone 60. Um, yes, the economy is slowing, the global economy is slowing, but it is still growing, especially in the non-OECD countries. We've already accounted for non-OECD countries, sorry, OECD declines next year because mm -hmm. we have a mild recession in the U.S., Europe, Japan, Korea. Uh, about a million barrels per day of oil demand growth next year. So we've already accounted for the slowdown. $60 oil should help us with more demand than that, not less. Okay, so then what's the view at 12 months? Are you loading the proverbial tanker here? on Brent crude or, for that matter, a stock like ExxonMobil? Is, it, is there enough tension there for you to climb on board, or do you have to wait and see through December and through this OPEC meeting? I mean, look, for prudent risk management, of <coughs> course, you wait and see the, through the OPEC meeting. You're going to get a lot of headlines and noise uh, ahead of the meeting, for sure, like you're getting right now. But ultimately, we firmly believe OPEC Plus will uh, try and maintain balance in this market. Uh, they always have, and particularly with Prince Abdulaziz uh, at the helm in terms of Saudi Arabia. And like I said, demand isn't, uh, you know, demand is still growing, even if it is slowing. And we can see that in products prices. Gasoline and diesel prices have continued continue to go up even when crude has come down. So we remain constructive crude for next year, but in the short term, the turmoil does mean, you know, you, like you say, you never catch a falling knife, right? You just have to wait it out. Amrita, can you help us understand the price response to what we talked about with the OPEC Plus meeting? Why are prices so much lower on the news that they've delayed it because they're asking certain countries to make additional cuts? Shouldn't that not be the case? Shouldn't it be higher if they're going to be making more cuts? I think people are just very, very worried about what happened in 2020. Do you remember when Saudi Arabia and Russia just turned on um, all the taps and, you know, the OPEC Plus deal fell apart for a month and you, we had negative prices, of course, uh, exacerbated by COVID. That's the fear that, oh, is the deal falling apart? Like, the market uh, the, and traders in particular, they tend to be uh, quite black and white that way, right? There's, there's very little room for gray. Um, and, you know, part of my <laughs> job in, is always around, no, it is not, it's not falling apart. It is, it's just like they need some time to, because again, it's to convince certain countries uh, and everybody's asking me right now, now, oh, is the deal going to fall apart? Uh, are the Saudis unhappy? Are they going to flood the market? Those fears are completely unfounded. I love the uh, therapist role that you play as you talk to clients. You know, it's okay. The world isn't falling apart. I Let's take a like look. I feel like that every day. <laughs> Therapy with them. I can with feel Amrita. that. Therapy I can feel them. that. Um, Rita, just quickly here, you mentioned that this OPEC Plus meeting might be taking place virtually. Do you have any sense why? Yeah. It was to do with really logistics around COP and, you know, it, especially if it was before COP, right? Like all the ministers coming uh, down to Vienna, if they'd already agreed on a deal, whether it's an additional cut. And like I said, a deal is already in place, right? What I think the market must understand is even if they can't get an additional cut through, there is a deal already in place through the end of the year where the cuts are going to continue, right? So there's, quote, unquote, <clears throat> nothing to be worried about. If that was the case, there wasn't a need to come to Vienna, especially if they had to go straight back into COP anyways. I think that's one of the reasons why we heard about the virtual rumors. Again, mm. these are all rumors at this stage. Emerita, thank you for the brief. Emerita Sen of Energy Aspects thank here you. with oil. Uh, West Texas now down uh, four point. Uh, one percent as well. You know, you talk about over the river and through the woods and you wonder what a gallon of gas is going to do. And that's a whole political element 
as well. I mean, do we get everything in the country down below $3, excuse me, $4 uh, per gallon? Dare, how much of the country is going to see two ninety nine dollars gasoline? Oh, yeah. I mean, just taking a look <clears throat> at oil prices, they've come, right. down, come down dramatically. And you can really tell when you go to fill up your tank. I mean, right now, $3.28, the average gallon of gas in the United yeah. States right now. That is down from a high I mean, again, in September of almost $4 a gallon. I wonder what rents will do as well. We haven't even talked about it today, but I'm sorry. Um, the OER, the rental dynamic, the housing dynamic, we're completely jaded in New York City. Jonathan Miller tells us that. But the rest of the country, there's some real rent disinflation, I guess is how I'd put it. How many different stories are there in each state, right? I mean, it just each location has its own story right now. With well, slightly different microeconomics <clears throat> and really feed into how people feel, which sometimes seems at odds at the global overview of economics, right? Somebody right. in a different state with a higher unemployment rate and higher inflation might feel right. something different than someone in a different state with a different certainly background. Certainly us jaded New Yorkers who don't travel and don't cook at home. <laughs> who are you talking about, Tom? Well, on behalf of Jonathan Fair, he's got the whole hat on and the whole thing. Oh. On behalf of Jonathan oh, yeah. Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and all of our team, have a safe Thanksgiving.